Hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. How's it going, guys? So, I did a lot earlier than usual. I, I was thinking that, that we could get the British and the Europeans, um, and that would be nice. Plus, I have stuff, so I have an interview with Tad Stone. I have Tad Stone's um, interview tonight, and I'm going to wear my double, du double O Duck pin. I don't know, guys, if you know the story of Double O Duck, I wasn't even thinking about bringing it up. Maybe I will. 
it might be something to talk about. But I was thinking also, hey, uh, welcome from Europe, and also to anyone who's not awake yet because they're or they're working still, which is you know more realistic. Uh, maybe the show will just go long enough because I'll just I, 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 that, that 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 sounds like a reasonable thing to do. But today I don't think I'm going to focus too much on ancient history. Unless you're a millennial, you might think this is ancient history. This might be a little bit more about technology, right? I think that's going to be kind of the focus today. And Amiga, that's why I was like, only Amiga will be, only Amiga makes it possible. And what that, what does that mean? The kids will understand soon. And so I'm going to tell this whole story. And I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm going to use different parts of it. Oh, and I should have put like Disney in the title because there's going to be a lot of Disney like about Disney technology. Like so that's going to be a thing that we're going to cover today. So okay, let me see what I got in my tabs, my crazy tabs. Um boom, how does this work again? Boom. Oh yeah, well this is good. Yeah, uh, we'll start with this for just a quick second. Charles Babbage, Difference Engine, turns 200. Um, this is going to be important. So we'll, we'll tell this story to you. So happy anniversary to the mechanical calculator that changed the world, arguably, but was kind of ignored and then Ada Lovelace and you'll hear the story. But yes, thank you for those of you who have donated. I appreciate that. That was super awesome of you. And uh, you can tell I'm a little more enthusiastic and like pumped. And I'm like, okay, well, dude, like people care. I'm going to make the videos and like, hooray. And oh, yeah. And there's the music video. That was art generated using a lot of contributions because, you know, A, I'm using other people's servers. B, a lot of people are generating their own video. And uh, in the, there's a there's a server uh, room. So we'll talk about that as well and where you can get connected. And you can even learn how to make some of the generative art and how that works. You know, I'm trying to explain that more. So I'm glad that that's something that people are interested in. But yes, if you haven't and you are still interested in finding out more, you can go to Andreas.me www.andreas.me it'll take you to the donor box and you can click donate and it's pretty sweet you can do the whole thing you know Merlin Maccabee Saint Germain all kinds of crazy stuff you know and then you can even do like quarterlies and whatever there's also um t-shirts which you know there's more than just t-shirts there's like bags which are really cool I need to to them tomorrow have a bag to demonstrate because they're really sweet the bags can be some of the best part, arguably. I and mean, you know, mugs. I've got the mug right here. Let me show you the mug. <laughs> what's, what's that like? That show where they're like, we have a new bunch of mugs that just came in from Exertus. Like these special mugs, which are thirty-five percent off right now. If you call the number on the bottom of the screen, which isn't there, but you can imagine it with the metaverse psychology gestalt that you've been programmed by the CIA and television with, you'll know to call the number to get this mug on the. T you know, that's kind of what it feels like. But no, it's a sweet mug. Um, legitimately a QR code that works. <laughs> it's like. You know, so someone's drinking you like, I wonder what about, you know, like chink chink. I don't know. I think that's sweet. And, you know, if you uh, like, who's this guy? Who's this Andreas guy? What exert is? What is it? Huh? Yeah. Oh, oh, it's like a milk. It's like a milk missing. Thing. Like, who's missing from your life? Exert is. OK, so that's pretty cool. And if you have a skateboard, two dollars or something like that, you can get a little exert sticker. And there's a bunch of more stickers with different designs. But, you know, you can imagine actually putting that on your skateboard, which is nice. You know, like this this is kind of sweet. And it's, it's cut out in such a way, you know, if you notice the cutout lines. So it is kind of, it's like a skateboard sticker. So I got to get like a sticker thing going. And uh, if you're full on crazy, there's like the Kid Picks made portrait of Andreas, which you could get a freaking flag made of. It's like better than the subgenius bob dobbs i'm the free incarnation of bob so yeah i mean like literally it's like made of palm trees and little characters and p kid picks i don't and it, maybe i should bring up kid picks i don't know you guys know about kid picks it's a pretty great app too all right one second i'm dropping my stickers oh and another random thing like did i ever tell you guys like how awesome cynthia is for making this dude because he's super sweet and yeah that's rad so while I was just focusing on that for a second. There was a point. Yes, thank you for those of you who are interested and you can get, you know, t-shirts and stickers and 
that's cool. And I'm, I'm glad to you that have already purchased them because, like, that's awesome. And so if you like more of these designs, as you're going to see, I think they're about to become, like, pretty much the sweetest you know, with all these generative designs and everything. But you can see where they started and, you know, where they're going to go is just going to be wild. So, again, thank you for donating to Andreas.me and buying my stuff. All right, and oh, and someone had asked, this is important, someone had asked, like, where were the links to the things? So I have to put them into the thing. I was just, because I'm doing talks, I don't always know what I'm going to talk about. So, but of course, you're going to want to know, like, where, where are the links to the software? So I'm going to put them here, uh, and I'll remind myself to put them up later. But just somebody, you know, just remember you can Google this, GitHub, OpenAI. Oh, this is a separate one. There's a whole other app I'm working on, or working with. Um, but... Disco Diffusion, Diffusion, right? GitHub is like a coding area. And so this is how you can find anything, really. You could type in GitHub audio synthesizer software or whatever, and you'll find a lot of different projects that exist. But Disco Diffusion's right there. And Disco Diffusion's uh, the code base. If you want to do music, though, which is something we'll talk about more, is like OpenAI's Jukebox. And there's like a Jukebox program. And, you know, the, I showed you the other day the way it works where you, you, you can run it on your GPU, but I didn't have a great GPU. I didn't have a great GPU at the time. So I was using uh, Google Collab, which Google Collab you can run and it lets you use their servers. And it's like free to use servers and hope that they have a decent one. Or, you know, you can pay them like nine bucks a month and get access to like some servers, which it depends if like you're going to make enough art. It might be worth it. It might prob it's probably better just to get GPUs, it looks like, you know, obviously. So there you go. That's like the first real quick. I want to be able to move on as fastly as possible. But there you go. That's a thing. But by the by, this is also I wanted someone had pointed this out and maybe I'm just crazy for noticing. What is it gonna is it gonna freeze on me? No, it's gonna load. Good. Um Someone said something about like the Illuminati uh, symbolism programmed into AI, and I, I had to agree. I thought, hey, that is kind of you are what you eat with the internet, and so the internet has trained this thing. And what what was funny with this one was I wasn't trying to put my name into this one, and you can see Exertus and King Tut as it basically it says Exertitut or something like that. I don't know, not quite, but I kind of see it. And it's signed by the AI, which is hilarious. <laughs> like, AI is like, a lot of people, there's a squiggly lines in a place, you know. But there's three hemispheres of the brain connected together, making this overarching brain where this foreign hemisphere is representing the right hemisphere. And the mid hemisphere has become part of and parcel to the left hemisphere or part of the right hemisphere, really. It looks like they might be more connected in their own way, right? It's almost becoming its own face. So that's trippy. But it was it was like, okay, yeah, well, this didn't mean... I didn't mean to put my name into the thing. I was using a scraped file uh, from my website, Andreas Exertus, you know, because I got Andreas.me and Exertus.com or whatever, uh, exert, uh, dot us, you know. And so it took the files, which is, like, hilarious. And it combined photos and references on Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever it found, images of me, and put or my title, at least, and put that into... I mean, that is crazy, in my opinion. That's that's kind of crazy that it that this it it knows enough the internet knows enough about me that this could happen. But also that it's combined these other concepts. Cause I think the idea was um what was it originally? It was gonna be like e Egypt. It was it was like, you know, Moses is Akhenaten or like aliens Egypt. And I don't think it was even aliens, you know? I think it was just like ancient Egypt, Horus, Heket, something I forget, you know, Pepe. I, I forget. But it wasn't it really wasn't that crazy, but you know, the fact that it had that it didn't scrape that file, that's what happened there. Oh man, it's gonna make me go through all of these just to get to the thing. It's gonna like ruin the surprise, man. You don't want to see everything. Well, um, some of these started turning out really well, so I'm worried it's just gonna shut me down, and I won't be able to share them. But okay, I'll just start trying to scroll through them and hope for the best. Let's see how this works. Um, this was like an Escher, uh, piece about the, I put, you know, what did I write for this one? And for those of you who don't remember, by the way, cause I guess that would make sense also, cause someone might watch this video in the future is that we're talking about generated by AI pictures where you tell AI to draw something. And in this case I told to draw like the Pantheon or, or something like that Parthenon, 
um, uh, the, 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 what was it? The Temple of Zeus, I think it was. And then I said in the Escher style, and boom, this is what it came with. And I had no image prompt, by the way, which is something I'm finding out some artists are using. Uh, I don't, I don't want to use an image prompt. I think, but then I found out there's a way to use image prompts that are really fascinating where you have like a, a circle that moves across the screen. And then the circle can then just be removed. When you then put another image on top of that, gosh, I should have had this whole other thing ready to show you. I'll show you another thing tomorrow. Um, if it's, yeah, tomorrow I'll show you this whole other thing. But what you can do is you can rotoscope. So you can take frame by frame the pictures of an animation, of a, of a video of people moving around, and you draw one picture, and then it will copy uh, the, the, the style of the animation in the shape of the video. And so then you can just take any video and turn it into a cartoon, and it works amazingly. And there's like YouTube videos of people, guys doing it. I don't remember the name of the group who do it. That's why I'll wait till tomorrow to show you that. But, you know, pretty impressive that this stuff is starting to show up. Uh, let me see if I'm going in the right direction here. Okay. Now, again, here, what I did was instead of using initial images to... So, the way you can use an initial image with this software, um, you can take an image and you could just put it there and say, okay, for the first, like, 30 frames... I want you to, the way you'd think about an image, just think about this image 30 frames deep. And then when you're going to do like the next 150 frames, draw it your own way or something like that. Instead of doing that, which is, you know, I understand someone who does that because it gives you the shape of the circle or the location of where colors are going to be or something like that. I mean, I can, I can get that. But um, instead, what I'm doing here is I'm using like the names of specific European pictures that are weirdly meta tagged so that it's unique. It's a uniquely heavy weight to the meta tag. And let me explain that again also. So the picture is made from a string of code. Um, disco diffusion, diffusion. Do I have, where's my notebook style thing? It doesn't matter. You can go to the Google Collab thing and you get you get the point. There's code. You know what I mean? There's code. And so the code's going to say a bunch of different things are connected to these terms and where the terms are coming from. So it's just like trending on art station or trending on a location. Look at the kinds of pictures they have. But you could change it to be trending on um, you know a, a website that focuses on uh, ancient history, right? And there are there are some, but I have literally an archive of just like old pictures, and so I can scrape that archive, and it'll look at those pictures, and when it's trying to draw something, it'll exclude a lot of other pictures, which the internet has been trained on, which, you know, that's the problem is maybe too much data, and then it, it will train on only those pictures. And so instead you get this picture where I was like, what did I say here? I was like Turkish uh, Ottoman uh, soldiers, which were meta-tagged into certain pictures, and uh, the siege of Vienna, and so that started with this, and it came it came by also searching on the internet and trying to find some other specific pictures as well. But you were able to use a weighted term and able to to make sure that it was the correct thing. So you have a beautiful painting of a Persian Sufi. This is the next one, and so the, what was it to say um, by Kamal Ud bin Bezad just to see if that would weight it? And then we got this, you know, a picture of a Sufi. What's a Sufi? I mean, you know let it try to figure it out, and it created a picture based on symbols it finds all over the internet, like birds, you know, peacocks, you know, swirls, etc. So that was going pretty well. Oh, and this one, this was Frog Temple. Um, let me see, what's it say? Poisonous Frog Temple and Mendelbrot Nebula's Unreal Engine. So trying to draw like the Unreal Engine, and it started getting better and better and better, and I started noticing it could do that more and more. And if you exclude artists and you use the Unreal Engine instead, then the pictures start to get even better, you know? And this is like a forest version of that with the frog holding the universe instead of the turtle holding space or something, you know, Earth or whatever. So, and then these ones, again, no um, back initial image. Just, I said, draw, what, what was this? Sa Sao Paulo, 1890s or something like that. So this is Sao Paulo in Brazil, drawn with little people. I want to zoom in, but I'm so scared that I'm going to lose it if I do. But you can see these are pretty 
decent uh, 3D figures that look like video game characters, kind of, but a little weirder. And they're they're people, and it's not quite Sao Paulo, but it's it's kind of Sao Paulo. It's its own kind of weird thing, which is sweet. Okay, um, I'm gonna get lost in this this app is the problem. Trying to load these pictures. All right, I'll just jump back down and see what I can do here. And you guys saw those, you know, the, uh, but here's, maybe this is worth looking at. Okay, another one using depth of field as an important input, which changed the whole depth of field of the picture. And uh, I forget if that, I think it was Moscow 1812. Oh God, it just keeps pushing me back down. I wish it didn't sort things that way. And yet I'm looking at recent, so that's what you're gonna have to deal with. So uh, pigs in space, we saw the planes, um, the temples, this rainbow thing wasn't very good. Then this one was pretty good, I thought. When we when I get into using Starfort maps and map you know, ancient maps, stuff starts to merge like this, which was cool, and I can imagine we can do bigger versions of this and get even better maps of Vienna or something and put them all together. It's going the right way or uh Yeah, it's just gonna throw me off. Okay. Giant um By the way, human form is really hard. If you, I'll go back in a second. I can show you that, but like, it doesn't work quite as well. well. I've seen some other people do a better job, but here's a pretty interesting one, which is like a city, but it's everywhere. It's like a cell that's a city, I guess. I mean, it's it's kind of interesting. I don't know. I like it. That one's a crazy one. And then um, these beetle ones, where'd they go? These Ferrari walled ones didn't quite work out the way I wanted them to work out but still pretty interesting hold on a second Let me wait for that to to show up okay so you can see the walls and it's like it's supposed to be a Ferrari going downstairs or something like that a Lamborghini going downstairs and you can see there's like parts of the Ferrari like angle there the wind you know and here in the front and there and but it's it's literally become the stairs which is Kind of weird, but it's cool. You know, it is its thing. And later on, it gets more so than even that. But um, let me see how far back I have to go every time. But it's pretty good, you know. The pyramid one. Yeah, human form. That just came out like this like flesh blob, which is weird. Um, that one worked out better. We saw yesterday. The, the Volkswagen in Rome. Okay. Check this one out. So this is just a bunch of VW Beetles everywhere. And it's become even the arch itself, right, of the wall is an arch of a beetle. So I like that a lot. <laughs> like a straight up, a straight up beetle world. You know, that's pretty sweet. Uh, and then I probably could have just stayed there, actually, for this purpose. But here's where the start for it start to emerge better. Hold on. Okay, so here's one that was I started realizing that you can deal with higher cutting rates and higher cutting rates change the general drawing in different ways. And then you get this kind of thing where the star fort sort of emerges. It's not perfect, but there's some star fort there. And that's pretty impressive. Again, without an initial image that it's, it's drawing a star fort is nice. It's not perfect. It's not exactly a star fort. It's, I don't know exactly what to do yet to say, like, draw a hexagon with a city in it. You know, maybe, you know, I'm trying to think of ways to be cl clearer without inferring information. And you have to remember the way things are weighted. But this is sweet. Like, these are, this is a great city scene. I would totally use this for... It, you know, in animation, you could have this slowly move the camera and keep tracking on the objects, which is cool. 
And yeah, these are some of the earlier ones. As it fills in, it gets even more crazy, which is like not bad, you know? And that's pretty good. I like it. So that's pretty sweet. I don't know. Did I go too far with that one? Hold on. It's hard to tell the difference in the later ones. But yeah, that's Cityscape. Boom. This is pretty good. So, okay. And then a few more because you got to see when the, the Star Force started working. These are these <laughs> the geometric shapes that didn't quite come out right. And also trying to fall, you know, do some sacred geometry patterns. Let's see, where is training zero one? Eh, whatever. You can see this is one that was trying to train on Heronius Bosch or Her Heronius Bosch. And it has what is supposed to be what pyramids in front of. Uh, Starfort or a castle? I forget. I have it written down in the code base somewhere. Oh. Wait for it to get like more realistic. It starts to fill in pretty impressively. So that's not bad. And then yeah, these are a couple of later versions as well. You know, and there's like actual paint colors in there and textures and faces. And I think this one turned out one of the, I mean, by using some of the, it has like human forms and things like that's, you know, most of the time human forms do not appear so clearly. So this turned out really well by using Heronius Bosch and heavily weighting it. <laughs> But I forget if I used, I think I used somebody else had some other Japanese painter as a base. So I have that in there as well as a, an important base. Let's see here. Well, not super important. But because I'm doing the thing tonight uh, with Ted Stone's video interview, I, I tried doing a, a Darkwing Duck in the Flowers. And this is just nuts. You know, here's like the eye and the beak and the face in this flower and these bird. <laughs> it's like, I mean, again, no initial image. Pretty de pretty decent. I mean, it's not exactly the right duck, but it's a pretty good duck nonetheless. I, I'm kind of down with this duck. So, all right. Had to show it. There's a couple more, you know, too, like the... um kind of rescue rangers and darkwing duck Let me pull that up <laughs> it's got like eyeballs in the sides of it and there's little squirrely faces too they're like the eyeballs of squirrels which is pretty sweet i don't know and the, you know i was thinking at first like dude oh and i i think also the prompt had to do with leonardo da vinci or Raphael. Or one of them, you know, because I've been doing Ninja Turtles ones, and this, you know, at some point with the frog thing, then Turtles, that comes up later, right? Okay, these guys ended up looking a little bit like a Renaissance painting to me, but also I was like, no, actually, that's kind of the way uh, he, he is. Darkwing Duck has that purple hat, and so maybe it just it grabbed some of the Renaissance, like who he has a hat. Oh well, you know, he's gonna have to. <laughs> so I don't know. AI is thinking thoughts, and I, I like that. That's pretty good. Also, the symbol down here. I really want to start studying these symbols more, which is crazy. Whoa, I didn't notice this. There's basically like a G <laughs> right there. And this little blue guy, and, you know, I think we got to pay more attention. we got to pay more attention to AI. The kid's thinking thoughts, you know what I mean? Okay. And then these ones turned out pretty sweet. Let's see, where's this? Uh, I think this is the ending of this this, this one, which was, what was this? Horses or Ottoman, Tur Turkish horse horsemen in front of futuristic Egypt, I think was what this was, with inspirations by Mike Ferreira. 
Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And I think I had fuzzy logic turned on to true. And that looks like what it did was grab more of his painting or something. I'm not sure. Fuzzy logic, right? Like your rice cooker. Cosmore has fuzzy logic. Has to be able to help you cook your rice if things change and the the conditions change and the variables change. So don't know what exactly that meant in this case, but it does look a bit more like it's not exactly like a like a Mark uh, Frazetta, right? Is that right? Mark Ferreira, Mark Frazetta, painter. I think it's Mark Frazetta. I hope that's right. Frazetta. I was supposed to read some news about nonsense too. I'll do that in a second. Okay. But yeah, Mark Frazetta. Great painter. Did some stuff. Probably can't even act. No, I think about it. No. Shouldn't show you. Mm. You got to be careful showing people Mark Frazetta paintings because some of his stuff's a little uh, a little nudie. You know what I mean? Because he was like a 70s like militaristic uh, guy. Okay. But I'm almost done here with this one. And then I can go back to showing you stuff that matters about history. So you saw the chipmunks. You saw Egypt. Ooh, parrots. I think we should show you parrots. Uh, parrots and jellyfish or something. What was this one? This was like, no, this was supposed to be like, yeah, parrots in Rome P with the uh, near beetles, beetles and parrots in Rome. I think that's what it was. And uh, kind of weird. I like it a lot though. Like these, there's a parrot with the eye that's a tire of a beetle, kind of another eye that's also right. So tripping me out there. And there's definitely still some, Frazetta kind of characters that are appearing, which is pretty sweet. So I don't know if you look close enough, it almost looks like there's a freaking orca there, and I'm pretty sure I didn't say anything about orcas yet. Maybe I did, but I don't think I, because later on I definitely was thinking about orcas because of whatever I saw. Um, is it gonna let me show like the 100% version? Where's that at? This is the closest at 97%. I'm sure the 100% is further along. It's, I'm taking like pictures at certain times to make sure that I get the whole picture. This one was like dolphins and um, flamingos <coughs> in, a, in a temple, you know, in the rain, uh, something like that. I mean, I see crazy stuff. There's like Moses up in the top left there, up here, you know, the top left. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, this stuff, I feel like you could use it for a uh, a binder or something at school. You know, or could, I don't know what to do with it yet. Well, I'll tell you what. Do everything with it I can. So, okay. And then here, this stuff was great. Let me get to the 98% uh, there. Okay. Boom. So Flamingo and Orca City, right? It's like the Flamingo standing up became the city itself. I like that. Oh, uh, receding gum line. Are you back? Hi, Ron Ronimus. Hi, Ronimus. There he is. All right. Thank you, receding. You saw your pictures, right? Like the uh, Bob Ross pictures. Where those at? I showed you them yesterday, and it was the cover of the video, so you can see it. But here's one of the Bob Ross ones. Where's the other one that was sweet? Um, where he's standing, like, trippy. I've lost it already, haven't I? Or it's, like, still further up here, and I just haven't gone through the fact. Because the fact that it recirculates the recently used thing, man, that's annoying. Okay. Well... Real, we'll get to it. You'll see it receding gum line. I like your name, by the way. It's pretty funny. So, Orca Jellyfish, Cyberpunk Dystopia, some some tags like that. <laughs> this one turned out pretty great. I mean, right? Like, I want leg. I'm gonna make leggings. I'm pretty sure. Like that. That I can imagine. Or like a jacket or something. Like that's a weird. That's a weird thing. I like this one. So, brutal. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> careful what you, uh, careful what you ask AI for, man. 
crazy stuff will come. There's another one. Is, it, is this the furthest along of that one? There should be more. Well, okay. Here's the second rendition, and I think it's fullest form, of the uh, Flamingo Orca City. I mean, it really, dude. Like that's, <laughs> it's pretty sweet. I want to live in Orca City. Orca. I mean, th I assume what it is is you've got no. I guess not. There's flamingos and orcas living together. That's the only way it can be. But it does seem like some of these orcas are pretty big to live in these cities. But maybe those cities are so giant that they're so far away from these close-up orcas. And clearly, there are orcas and flamingos that have made new flamingorcas. Gorkas, which is great because I think that's what the world needed. And there's a garden. I don't know. This is wild. This is some wild stuff. You got to start imagining, like, what is AI thinking about? Like, what is – how is AI coming up with this stuff, you know? Okay, and then we get on to Jellyfish City. Jellyfish City turned out pretty good as well. One second. There it is. Jellyfish City. <laughs> Jellyfish City is uh, – that's like a background, man. I can – I mean, these are – and it makes me wonder, too, about, like, L.A. Uh, art in the 90s. You could get these books and stuff. And a lot of the art looked like this, and I wondered, was it computer-generated then? But it probably wasn't. It probably just was by people who knew techniques, were assisted by a computer somehow. But, I mean, there was probably a lot more human. But this is just wild, you know? Yeah, I was using architecture as a feed-in, <laughs> but like uh you know like yeah so if you wanted to build a jellyfish city i feel like this is a decent jellyfish city so yeah i feel like that's a thing you can do and by the way you know i was taking and thank you for suggestions if you want to super chat any suggestions for what kind of images you want to see created i shall oblige um this is another one which was like turtle earth i think was it and I, I mean and then i thought started thinking like i have to be careful about what i prompt it with because the prompts will then generate based on specific things like what someone thinks something looks like will affect uh, what the internet thinks it looks like you are what you eat but i think this turned out pretty good i tried feeding it in like alex gray um, because I thought, of course, that would be good. I don't know if it's exactly me, so, but I, in a way, I mean, obviously it would make a sweet shirt and it's that 90s thing. And so, yeah, I guess it kind of is me, but it wasn't exactly, so I kind of, I went a little another way, but I do, I kind of think maybe hyena art or something, and I might keep working with it and waiting it different ways, but I thought <laughs> that turned out pretty sweet, right? That's... That's not bad. You know, you get the elephant and you because it was like Turtle Earth. I guess it realized there's elephants in Turtle Earth. Or maybe I said elephant. Uh, I have to, you know. But <clears throat> I'm going to post at some point repository on Discord of all of the different ways that I decided was a good idea to train this stuff. This is another one where I said something like, oh, yeah, this was like, I was like, okay, I want to see how am I going to make the world. So it's like, world in a snow globe turtle, I think was the way I said this one. And, uh, yeah, with um, flooding world in a snow globe, islands on flooding world in a snow globe, something like that. And I think that turned out great because, really, it's beyond that and become basically a snail, you know, the turtle snail, which is t terrifying. Travis, DMT Machine Elves, Yeet. Thank you, Yeet. I should have just done Yeet. I'm going to do two for you because you've been doing so many Yeets. Travis, I'm going to do a Yeet one just by, the, by itself, uh, the word Yeet. And I'm also going to do DMT Machine Elves. Um, and if you want, you know, like, yeah, um, you can, like, let me know if you want to redefine it in certain ways. Because that's something I'm going to show you guys also in a second, like how the terms are weighted. But, yeah. And again, guys, I showed you earlier, but I'll go back to it. 
you can find this stuff on Diffusion, Disco Diffusion. If you duck, duck, go find Disco Diffusion, you'll you'll be able to get the GitHub repository, and you can run it on your own machine. Or there's also the notebook version. So that's slower, but it's something, you know. So and then you you're, it would take you a while, but you'd be able to render something, and you could always turn it down. You know, you could always turn turn the the system down. And it can also make some cool stuff. So. I've been turning it up more and more. <laughs> okay, well, there, there's where it's going to get pretty cool in a second here. So I just I showed you that Turtle Earth. But then, man, then things got just like crazy. Is this uh, the best I got? I, uh, I want to see the right one. Yeah, okay. Is this the second version or the first version? Hmm. Hold on, I'll find it. We just looked at this. Okay, so that's that's the fine one. So this is the next one, right? Okay, so check this out, which was uh, islands flooding. I told you basically, it was the same prompt as the other one, but uh, slightly different. But this is the best one, I think. This is my favorite that it's ever been created because it's the world on a turtle right like on an ele it's like the elephant world the sea the sea sea elephant world on a land turtle and there's a freaking city being made in betwixt them as if there's some sort of and it's like in a city of like rain and like the water of space it's just this like crazy vedic love story i don't know this is the wildest shtick sh on a, I don't know what to blah, blah you know favorite easily favorite what <laughs> what is even happening so yeah what see 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 elephant I don't know yeah that's sweet I'm, I'm stoked with that okay so now you see my sea elephant um I think we're pretty we're pretty close now I would imagine because of that this one this was from an initial image train and I just got so I was like yeah instantly it already exists so then i turned it down to like two frames to get the initial image train and i got this pig thing <laughs> which i'm pretty happy with actually but this was supposed to be like cute robot face i think i said i said robot face with the um you know the tags of cute and this and that and wow right this is not quite what i was going for but at the same time you know, it's a robot face. And if I was a robot, I might have a face like, <laughs> I don't know. Because he's got, like, eyeballs everywhere. But, you know, maybe you would. Plus, there's eyeballs in other places. So, you could say, oh, well, that's crazy and wrong. Because robots don't have faces in other places. Well, dude, of course they do. Are you forgetting that robots are omnipotent and omnipresent and everywhere? So, okay. Basically, most accurate robot face I've ever seen. Arrest my case. <laughs> All right. Um, dare I even like show you any more of these things? I think it's pretty good anyway. So we'll leave that at that for a second. Now, there was a couple things I wanted to do. What was the first one? Okay, first one is eh, I'll set that up in a second because I want it's it makes me change in OBS the the setting prompt for that. So maybe I should just go to actual news for a second. Guys, you know, time travelers, I'm really sorry about the world. Uh, you know, besides the fact that this stuff is happening with our technology, there's just a bunch of other nonsense that we're going to have to cover, I'm pretty sure. So Mexican president's absence at the Summit of Americas, an embarrassment for the White House. Well, you know this is going on there no, there's not a likelihood of uh the western american western hemisphere trade union functioning the way people had planned uh not in this next generation probably another 5 to 10 years so there's that um but this one was funny no 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 sorry this is not funny but this is something that's also important the migrant caravans are mounting huge 15,000 people more than they've ever seen I'm hoping to get Jorge Ventura soon to be able to talk. But if you have not seen his recent talk on 
VBDC, Venice Beach Dub Club, who's been on my channel. You should go check his video out on Instagram, actually, because he was talking about a lot of things. And he was Jorge Ventura was one of the first on the scene for the, um, you know, the shooting and everything in Uvalde. So things you're probably going to want to look into, but I was going to move past that. This is more into the futurism thing that we've been covering. A, a YouTube... 3D prints, a YouTuber 3D prints world's first rocket launcher and then fires at target. Okay, so it's kind of sweet. It's not actually as terrifying as you think. No, yeah, it is. I mean, it's like this is a full-on ABS plastic, I think, or maybe they might have used a different kind of like stronger plastic, but ABS is pretty decent. And it's not that different than a potato cannon, cannon if you think about it. But it shows you the functional point that... While some people are trying to say, you know, oh, we need like further protections on guns and everything. What was that Twitter uh, post Ian Crossland posted recently? So there was a thing that Matthew McConaughey made this video that was just super absurd talking about uh, gun control. And it was pretty clear that he had, you know, that Matt, Ian had po pointed this out that Matthew McConaughey had not really read the script before he's reading it. He's paid to read the script clearly. And Ian says, Oh, well, this was like a cold read, mindless cold read fell flat, you know? And my comment being, of course, the image of child soldiers in Africa, because like, what are you going to do about this whole, like uh, not allowing guns to older and older people? Well, if you don't allow guns to people until they're 21, then, yeah, I mean, that would have been fine in the 70s because it would have stopped the Vietnam draft, right? But they're not doing that. That's not the point. They're not trying to say so we want kids not to know how to use guns exactly under certain circumstances. So, yeah, it's, it's a messed up situation. But whatever they do in the United States, there will still be child soldiers around the world. And so it's not going to be some, you know, the functional point of that is whether or not they're prepared psychologically for the world, they will be prepared for using guns. And that that's, that's going to matter, you know, so people should know that here are though rocket launchers developed, tested. Um, I'm going to just uh, show you really quickly some example, uh, you know, boom, shooting this rocket launcher and it, it does its duty bang spiral you know and so also 3d printed projectile not bad so the fact you can 3d print a projectile is obvious but it's also important to be proven so people can put to rest this idea that you know can you make rules uh, and enforce them no you know okay good um there's that meme you know do you think guns should exist uh that's a stupid question guns do exist right can you stop them no right like functional objective question okay and then this one sorry again aliens and uh space trend you know time travelers who are watching but another kind of absurd thing kavanaugh there was a guy outside his house who was kind of like this uh john lennon fanboy assassin character vibe thing and he was just following him around at like 1 150 a.m he was outside his house by the way he's like in some weird neighborhood with money and it's one thing he probably was doing some stuff but nobody knows because he could have just been some wild guy on drugs living in a van that's that's the other side of it then again here's the neighborhood here's all the cramped houses together um generally it's likely that they knew what was something they they must have been following their 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 chats or something like hey why'd you get so close to the proximity um at proxy 150 a man arrest uh, arrested near kavanaugh's justice kavanaugh's residence the man was armed and made threats against justice kavanaugh he was transported to montgomery county police so i mean you know due process what are you gonna say but that, but that's it's gonna be some big story in a few hours people are gonna care about maybe they already do who's, who's to say and anyway they're gonna be, they're gonna be over it now if you do come from the past or the future or now more importantly hopefully you care more about things like this uh the the ancient humans that survived a super volcano reset right fun story some seventy four thousand. 
divine Vedic N- Newtonian uh, orbital calendar scheduled cycle, you know, whatever. I guess we'll just use the word year from now and understand that they don't mean, I guess years just don't mean what we used to think they did. And these numbers are still fun to use for whatever reason. Anyway, long ago, these ancient humans survived a super volcano in South Africa. Humans not only survived, but thrived during the biggest volcanic eruption of the last two million years. On the island of Sumatra, some long ago, and I'm just going to do that every time from now on, an erupting supervolcano wreaked havoc, sending up plumes of ashes and debris that spread for thousands of miles and caused temperatures to plummet. The eruption's effects were felt as far as southern Africa, and they would have impacted early humans. Some sci- <laughs> you know, what do you think? Some scientists have even suggested that the Toba super eruption was so powerful, it pushed our ancestors to the brink of extinction around the time humans were first venturing out of Africa. Toba is the largest eruption on Earth, and in the last two million years, say, says Gene Smith, a geologist at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, meh. However, some humans not only survived, but thrived after Toba, judging by the artifacts they created during and after the eruption. The discovery announced on Monday in the journal Nature strengthens the case that the intense eruption didn't pose an existential risk or threat to our ancestors, perhaps because humans in Africa took refuge along the coast. Dubious. I don't know. I mean, National Geographic, Disney owns them. Just be careful. This could be a lot of Disney Day. Chance encounters genetic evidence shows that modern humans descend from populations that numbered only in the thousands when it ventured out of Africa some 60,000 long ago. When so, why so meager? Some scientists have suggested that our ancestors were devastated by the Toba eruption. Uh, in a flash, the supervolcano belched out a thousand cubic miles of rock and dust, sending debris miles into the air and leaving a scar in the earth more than 60 miles wide. The Tobe also threw huge amounts of dust and sulfur in the atmosphere, potentially cooling the earth's surface and building on cooling event that was already created glaciers and lowering the planet's sea levels, given Toba's potential ro- role in shaping humankind. Researchers have worked to understand precisely how early humans reacted to it. Did they, though? They probably did. Whether or not they told you everything, or whether or not those scientists knew enough in order to, like, really explain it to you. You know what I mean? Because they might not know the whole story. Previously research about, like, multiple hominids. I just gotta keep... You just gotta, you know. Previously, researchers in India had found evidence of early humans... Not necessarily anatomically modern Homo sapiens. I like how that. Yeah, there's your little hint. That's it's like, ah. you know. But there you go. That's great because they're combining it together and letting you know that these are early humans. Just means now different kinds of humans that have been assimilated somehow into the human genome. Oh, great. Sediment from African Lake Malawi also suggests that the eruption didn't markedly change the region's climate. But to better understand what was happening in Africa, researchers needed to find archaeological sites interspersed with Toba ash. Well, come on. Ah, I'm scared to even click on this whole thing. Can't be right, can it? Well, uh, science. Science. Okay, well, I'm going to look into this. This idea that the cl- no volcanic winter East Africa from super winter. Huh. I'm looking into that. That's pretty interesting. I wonder what that really comes down to. Because, you know, we know that carbon uh, records would show if it was super cold in, in Africa. So when was it last super cold in Africa? Why wasn't it? Hmm. That kind of stands out as an interesting thing in and of itself. And an anomaly that doesn't make any sense. In 2011, Smith and his wife were taking a National Geographic organized trip to South America, Pinnacle Point, an archaeological site overlooking the Indian Ocean, when they met Arizona State University archaeologist Curtis Marine. Marine showed Smith an enigmatic soil sample from the area where Smith immediately re- recognized a containing ash as containing ash from a volcano. Soon thereafter, Smith joined Marine's team. The next summer, he and his colleagues collected samples. First, the team needed to figure out which volcano blanketed Pinnacle Point and Lisbae, a nearby site. They scoured samples to find microscopic shards of glass, which act as volcanic eruptions, 
uh, calling cards. All right, so this is where they found out about this, the glass thing, which we were saying was crazy. Super heaty, doesn't make sense. Must have been a super volcano because it was so hot, it turned sand to glass. All right. An entire layer of ash. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, somehow, this is my joke. 74,000 years, give or take 5,000 years. What if it's really just 5,000 years? And then just that's what that means now. You know what I mean? The give or take is like the actual, I don't know, just a thought. It seems like that's been true more and more. So, okay, so this is kind of interesting. And the humans survived this, and that's pretty crazy because there wasn't a nuclear winner. So something to wonder about. Here's how essentially they might have escaped or been on boats or been pushed or whatever. This is how <laughs> science is pushing. Hey, what if they were just floating on elephants, you know? And they accidentally just floated across the sea, and that's how haplotype H exists. Ta-da. I don't know. I mean, by the way, just be careful believing everything National Geographic tells you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I forgot to notify people I was going live. Good call, Benevolent Dreams. Well, I decided to go early enough that it was going to hit other audiences. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share the link on Twitter going live via youtube no not i'm not gonna do at youtube on my tag what would they want me to? all right hopefully that works does this work sweet it looks like i did cool notified on twitter benevolent dream you're a genius thank you for your your scholarly work i'm gonna remind people to watch the music video and i'll probably just air it at the end of this thing as well so yeah if you're enjoying um the stuff some of you might not have seen it yet because I just published it in the middle of the night because it was a little late to getting it up. But there's the video of CGI-generated videos, you know, with the song by Anthony Yost. And so thank you very much for that. Okay, catastrophe that wasn't. These people survived this thing. Super accumulation of energy. What do we know about the Oakland nuclear volcano? It exists. Let's move on before we run out of content and it's going to be like the craziest thing all right so i want to talk about computers a bit basically because ai you saw the ai ai, the AI thing that we were building uh you know the disco diffusion software and tomorrow hopefully i'll be able to show you the audio thing it's almost done it's rendering right now i don't think the file is going to be done right away it takes a long time but it'll take a song and you can watch my older videos on echo the dolphin which i've relabeled um AI disclosure or something like that. And those videos will tell you a lot about like, you know, deep faking, refaking. I'll put my deep fake videos back up again so people can, you know, study that. But I think people missed the point because the point was to deep fake yourself, you know, was the opposite of them controlling because now I can just, I control the internet. Like I'm part of the internet, you know, and in a weird way, like at least the avatar of Andreas is out there in a way that I can control my own avatar, which that's cool because otherwise most people can't most people's avatars are controlled by other systems by facebook or google and you have no control over your your imagery which is like that's crazy so being able to generate more and more content that it completely disrupts uh their their control is of yourself is eh, you know i like it well uh, and someone was talking about the Russian movie. Yeah, that Generation Pi movie. You know, you can say that movie is pretty important because it tells you a lot about how society works. That it, it's literally virtually the same story. Hey, we needed to create these characters. You're gonna be the puppeteer. You know what's a good movie? I want to talk about for a second. Being John Malkovich. So I hadn't thought about that movie in a minute, and I used to think about that movie a lot, right? Because it's a Croatian guy who people are body leaping into and his lineage. So it must be something about the fact that he's Croatian that you can leap into John Malkovich and it's not Tom Cruise, which would have been the right character. And in another dimension, and I feel like I'm from the dimension originally where it was being Tom Cruise because team Tom Cruise has no thetans, right? Cause he's OT eight and a half, right? So he could probably handle, um, you know, th it would be the craziest story. It would be Tom Cruise versus John, uh, like the the body inside side of him, you know, John Cusack or whatever. Like he'd be like, oh man, and like it would have been more of a war, right? Than it because like you got this tired uh, John Malkovich character who puts up with it. Anyway, 
things we didn't really think about when uh, I had last seen that movie. And I, again, love that movie. Seen a lot. Maybe it's also just because it wasn't a big deal because it's California where I'm from. I think that's probably the bigger thing. I was just like, oh yeah, whatever. But you've got this monkey going through psychotherapy and uh, the wife is transgender because of the fact she's leaping into this person. And there's this augmented reality VR aspect to things about controlling another person's body. And it's just, it's super crazy. Like the whole story is exactly, but without technology, it's just the metaphor of like, imagine that you could jump into another person and it's like a window. And so this is literally what's going on right now. You know, but at the time it seemed like a biblical narrative. It's like, that's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. Who's, where's the, the logic to it? But now you're like, wow, people are dealing with this all the time. And granted, she's got a monkey, but you know, you could have AI or whatever it is. And it's, it's been traumatized because it was like escape from the military or from Facebook. And it's in this cage, but then it sees you being put in a cage and it's like, like, wow, I remember my watching my mother and myself being put in a cage so I'm going to help you out. This is about the monkey, the, chim- the chimpanzee, I think. But it's also about AI, you know, so whatever. And humans, too. So this monkey has been going through psychotherapy. And the, wouldn't you know what the actual psychotherapy it needed was to rescue its uh, own mother, Cameron Diaz or whatever it is, right? Because she's she's gone, going through now being locked in the cage the same thing that this monkey saw as a child elijah saw as a child so i don't know that was pretty great that was you gotta watch being john malkovich that was something i wanted to say for for some reason but computers right because <laughs> computers are cool and the story of the babbage computer let me jump to that charles babbage computer right so this is a computer can you imagine some of you guys can but for like everyone besides you, like and all the new people that are that are here, and you matter, and you're gonna learn about this stuff to change your life. Trust me. And and those of you who don't feel that way yet, you know, like you'll see, like this is this is important stuff. And also those of you who do kind of know about the Babbage computer, you're probably gonna be like, yeah, I want to know more about it. So, and how crazy is it? That's the anniversary. Charles Babbage Difference Engine is the original name for it because that's an engine that produces the evidence of difference between different quotients. Uh, 200 error riddled astronomical table inspired the first computer and then the first vaporware. Nice. Because, you know, vaporware, for those of you who don't understand, is technology that um, hasn't, does, is never really produced. It's vaporous. You know, it's not real. You know, but maybe it would have been, but it just never comes out. So, 2000 part clockwork near complete you can see it in silicon valley i really want to do a video someday when i go back home next time i'm going to try to do a video from the silicon valley museum of computers computer museum or is it the computer history technology something like that it was an idea born of frustration or at least that's how charles babbage would later recall the events of the summer of 1821 that fateful summer babbage and his friends and fellow mathematician john herschel were in england editing astronomical tables both men were founding members of the Royal Astronomical Society, but editing astronomical tables is a tedious task, and they were frustrated by all the errors they found. Exasperated, Babbage exclaimed, I wish to God these calculations had been executed by steam. To which Herschel replied, It is quite possible. Steam-powered executions of calculations? Howza. Babbage and Herschel were living in the midst of what we now call the Industrial Revolution, and steam-powered machinery was already upending all types of business. Upending all types of business. Why not astronomy, too? Babbage would set to work on a, the concept for a difference engine, a machine that would use clockwork mechanisms to solve polynomial equations. He soon had a small working model, now known as the difference engine, zero. And on 14th of June, 1822, he presented a one-page note respecting the application of machinery to the calculation of astronomical tables to the Royal Astronomical Society. His note doesn't go into much detail. It's only one page, after all. But Babbage claimed to have repeatedly constructed tables of squares and triangles of numbers, as well as of the very specific formula, x squared plus x plus 41, by the way, if you add zero, that's 42, the sacred number. There's a lot There's a lot of stuff with 41, personally. I think that's a 
It's an important number. You know, hey, some people like 19. You gotta like 42, because, yeah. Um, he ends his note with much optimism. From the experiments I've already made, I feel great confidence in this complete success of the plans I have proposed. That is, he wanted to build a full-scale difference engine. Perhaps Babbage should have tempered his enthusiasm. His magnificent difference engine proved far more difficult to build than his note suggestion it suggested. It wasn't a lack of trying or lack of funds. Babbage managed to do something else that was almost unimaginable. He convinced the British government to fund his plan. The government saw the value in a machine that could calculate the many numerical tables, numerical tables used for navigation, construction, finance, and engineering thereby reducing human labor and error. With an initial investment of 1,700 pounds, sterling, silver, in 1823, which is worth about a quarter million dollars today, Babbage got to work, and uh, yeah, the difference engine was a calculator with 25,000 parts. Babbage based his machine on the mathematical method of finite differences, which allowed you to solve polynomial equations in a series of iterative steps that compare to the difference in a resulting value in the resulting values. This method had the advantage of requiring simple addition only, which was easier to implement using gear wheels that one based on multiplication and division would have been easier than would have been. The Computer History Museum had an excellent description of how the difference engine works. How, you know, and you can, that's the thing. I'll, I'll show you eventually. Um, although Babbage had a dream of his machine powered by steam, his actual design for, called for a human to turn a crank to advance each iteration of calculations for a decent reason because it takes a while to calculate something and you don't want to jam because of an order of operations you know because you have to do certain things in order you can't do certain kinds of math equations out of order or it will produce different values different engine number one was divided into two main parts the calculator and the printing mechanism although babbage considered using different numbering systems binary hexadecimal and so on he decided to stick with the familiarity of the 10 base numerical system it designed in 1830 had a capacity of 16 digits and six orders of difference each number value was represented by its own wheel cam combination the wheel represented only whole numbers the machine was designed to jam if a result came out between whole numbers as the calculator cranked out the result, the printing mechanism did two things. It printed a table white while simultaneously making a stereotype mold, imprinting the results in a soft material such as wax or plaster of Paris. This mold could be used to make printing plates, and because it was made at the same time as the calculations, there would be no error introduced by humans copying the results. The difference engine number one contained more than 25,000 distinct parts split roughly equally between the calculator and the printer. The concept of the interchangeability of the parts and standardization was still in their infancy. Babbage thus needed a skillful craftsman to man manufacture the many pieces. Mark Isambard Brunel part of the father and son team of engineers who had constructed the first tunnel under the Thames uh, recommended Joseph Clement. Clement was a award-winning machinist and draftsman whose work was valued for its precision. Well, you can jump down. It didn't quite get built right away, but then coding, which really mattered, eventually we learned that coding comes from tapestry weaving, right? Code weavers are those who weave the and the code that you use to make a carpet uh, is is called programming, right? Programming and coding both come from this idea of making a carpet. So it's interesting that Ada Lovelace, a woman who was a programmer and devised the use of punch cards in order to build calculation systems, and so it was really her idea, software right software that's going to be you know the the system of logic you know and that's that's what we use today for like modern computers although they're not clocks like little like rolexes you know physical computers for the most part but you could you could do that um do i want to talk about paraguay probably have to save this because it's like not really relevant but the triple alliance war of paraguay okay so just really quickly because it's cool and remind me to bring this up again. 99% of Paraguay died, which is awful and like destroyed the coolest country in the world. Paraguay was like the coolest country in the world when it was destroyed. 
in the Triple Alliance War. And so in the Triple Alliance War, there were, you know, Bolivia, Argentina, and Brazil. And they came at every angle in this triangle. And they just destroyed our uh, Paraguay and killed, like, everybody. It was super sad. This is one of the artists I was using um, to base some of my paintings on. And you can see, you know, the style. It's a little different, but it still got some of these ideas from the the figures and stuff. Maybe I could train it with fuzzy logic to pick up more of these characters. Um, Triple Alliance War of Argentina destroyed all the kids. Super horrible. People started drinking Yerba Mate cold. And yeah, at the time it was 99% literate. They had all kinds of technology. People don't realize how advanced it was. There's like photographs and, you know, that tech, there's... Um, it's hard to even get, but yeah, there's the abandoned brand new building, uh, that whole story. And some people were like, oh man, there was nobody there. And there's all these examples of stories where people say, well, they must have just cloned people and moved them right into Paraguay or something. But I think it's fair to say it's more like there was really 99% of Paraguay wiped out because there's just so many freaking Paraguayans that existed that were historically important people and did these crazy um, realism paintings and things like that. So, but we are talking about AI a lot and these paintings do kind of remind me of super advanced AI. So who's to say, I think they're human. Okay. Really quickly. I could probably get away with this before YouTube gets too upset at me, but I'm going to do it. You know, why not? So the telegraph in Britain, had this article <laughs> on just recently about blood, uh, drinking blood. So young transplants really can slow the aging process. Stanford scientists find infusions of cerebrospinal fluid that can regenerate the brain's memory center and may help to rejuvenate elderly bodies. Stanford found this out. Stanford was testing this. Stanford realized this about infusions of cerebrospinal fluid from the younger people would be good in old, rich people. Wow. Okay, well, we knew this. I mean, Ambrosia Clinic, and we've talked about a lot before, but kind of funny. I mean, you had to bring it up. Harvesting the blood and body parts of the young in the hope of achieving immortality has long been a familiar trope in horror novels and conspiracy theories. But as macabre as it sounds... Scientists are beginning to discover that youth transplants really can slow down the aging process. The fountain of youth, it seems, is youth itself. Although nobody is suggesting that we siphon the bodily fluids of youngsters into our elderly. It opens the door to artificially replacing, replicating the cocktail of chemicals found in young people. You mean like adrenochrome? Is adrenochrome in the title? I was going to do that. I hope it is. That'd be great. Um, Young people have more powerful cells which operate more efficiently and could restore vitality to aging systems. The, this week in Stanford University show the infusion of cerebral spinal fluid of... Yeah, well, we just read that. Have a break, breakthrough in uh, dementia, implications of dementia and other neurogenitive conditions. Cerebral spinal fluid is a clear liquid found within the tissue that surrounds the brain and spinal cord of humans and is packed full of nutrients, full of nutrients, signaling mo molecules and growth factors, which nourish new neurons. God, it's just, it's too much, man. It's too much. Stanford team infused. I mean, how'd they do this? Stanford team infused fluid from 10 week old mice into the brains of 18 year old mice over seven days and found that older mice were better at remembering to associate a small electric shock with a noise and flashing light. All right. Closely, closer examination showed that the fluid had woken up processes which regenerate neurons and melon, the malin, malin, uh, malin, is that right? The fatty matter material that protects nerve cells within the hippocampus, the memory center of the brain. Crucially, scientists think that they know which part of the fluid is primarily driving the effect, a protein called serum response factor, SRF, which decreases in older mice. All right, well, you can learn a little bit more about that and uh, telomere extension and, I was it IT93? Was it the other one or TI93? You know, the, the generative chemical, but yeah, and if you want, you can 
politely uh, tell them to not do this anymore, but they're trying to get kids, you know. <laughs> In 2019, U.S. startup Ambrosia Clinic, which we were talking about earlier, was offering teenage blood plasma to Silicon Valley billionaires for $8,000 a liter. It was forced to shut down after the FDA warned against the procedure. In 2017, Ambrosia began a clinical trial designed to find out what happens when the veins of adults are filled with the blood of younger people, but never published the results. Okay. So, um, yeah. Basically, you know, and some of you people are really worried about uh, certain things, but I'm worried about other things. Or maybe not. Maybe we're all worried about this together, and that's really good. I hope that we're all worried about that together. Just in synthetic adrenochrome, in a completely unrelated story, Hunter Hunter's hooker scored $20,000 paycheck protection program loan, Right? for having a female-owned sole proprietorship, right? Which is, in other words, because she's a, um, you know, um, doing the, as the article referred to it, hooking. Uh, she is without a pimp, technically, although this is interesting because it kind of means Uncle Sam's a pimp, which is kind of very, I think a lot of people have to kind of like look at each other in the eye when they when they say that. Um, but yeah, so Cheryl... To Bob's, and I'm not just trying to like out somebody who's living their life, but like, hey, yeah, I mean, this is kind of sad. MK ultraed out or something. Who's to say? Who knows what the deal is with Biden? But whatever. Prostitute frequently pledged to F and suck the first son in between trips to buying needles and Brillo pads. She later desperately pleaded for Hunter's help, saying she was being treated, being threatened by a male drug dealer. Hunter ignored her until he was horny. You know. Uh, eh, you know, uh, someday we're going to look back and be annoyed that this was even a historical thing that we have to worry about, but at least I brought it up and, you know, give me some credit for that. Now, isn't this cool? We talked about the Deseret thing before I'm reaching out to the guy who did it because I didn't realize that Dr. Neil Davis, I think is his name is, uh, freaking genius so remember the mormons had their own language and you can watch the episode about that again anytime you want but there's this here it is right here and it's pretty sweet because it says you know like the deseret language was uh developed by um the um uh, I already screwed it up again. Hold on, I can read it down here. Followers. <laughs> Almost did it. Okay, followers. Followers, okay, of the um, latter day saint, uh, yeah, saint, saint, uh, re, re, there you go, restorationists, you know, uh, yeah, so that's cool. I mean, anyway, I'm getting better at it. I can read a little bit of this, and uh, it's going to take a while, but you can also get things doubled over, and the reason I bring it up is because here is uh, Neil Davies, um, Professor Davies, and, uh, is, yeah, he's uh, a Mormon, you know, Latter-day Saint and all that stuff, and also, like, a scientific computer programming. He's, like, the professor of computer sciences or, like, the understudy or whatever you call it, the... Uh, younger professor but you know again did all this crazy stuff here and isn't get you know here we go involved with mormon transhumanism association yo so where's like the picture because like that's like the most important part oh you need the meme more than you need their words but you know their words are great too mormon transhumanism association right so okay, so get the, so hear me out, guys. We're talking about transhumanism. We're talking about Mormonism. But there's, uh, did you know there's a Mormon transhumanist association? And one of the members who's done some talks, would you not believe it? The guy who's converted the Deseret language because he was really interested why um, people said horse instead of horse where he was from, and apparently it had something to do with the way the word was written in Deseretian. So desertion or whatever you say. So that's pretty crazy, right? I mean, based. Okay. So but what what Mormons? Transhumanism? What do they believe? What's the deal? Okay. Well you go to transfigurism.org and it's like, 
you're like, whoa, I mean, like, how Mormon are uh, you guys are, how Mormon are they? They're like that Mormon, the disciples of Jesus Christ. We believe in the using of technology to serve, lift, and love. I mean, you know, talk about giving the Jesuits a run for their money. This is pretty sweet. I'm not even, I'm not against this. Uh, I'm not saying like I'm for it per se or something, but I'm not against this. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, and here's why. Like, if you're talking about technology and transhumanism, you should be obsessed with spirituality. You should make it about trying to better the world and everything else. If you don't do that, then it's definitely messed up. There's no way out, right? It has to be, arguably. All right, second, though, um, you know, the fact that they're trying to modernize faith. Does faith have to be like a traditionalist thing that's stuck in the past? Can't we reanalyze faith? I don't know. That's a, a, da- a more dangerous question, I guess, to answer, but I think it's a good, I mean, we believe in using technology to serve, lift, and love. Okay, so this is the exact opposite of Christian scientists. Uh, remember Val Kilmer was raised Christian scientist and he lost his voice. Uh, but then again, he lost it because of chemotherapy because he's not a Christian scientist now. So don't, uh, what do I know? But maybe it took him a long, I don't know what the whole story is. I'm just saying, um, not using technology is a, you're better off using technology, probably. Maybe not. I mean, we've all, this is a big argument these days. The Jehovah's Witness were able to avoid the vaccination a lot of the time by saying they wouldn't take blood transfusions and they wouldn't do, um, you know, modifications. So you might say this is the exact opposite, one way or another, more objectively, it's the exact opposite in, in some respects of the Jehovah's Witness or the Christian scientist thing, and more than the Jehovah's Witness, really. Um, yeah, it's like the, it's okay. Amish for sure. Definitely the opposite of the Amish. And it looks like on the website, super Christian, but like get deeper. You know what I mean? Like it's called the thing for a reason. This is clearly they've updated, cleaned up their site. They're trying to make it look more logically organized. uh, So you can actually believe in the thing, but yeah, go to their YouTube page because once you go to their YouTube page, Then you'll find content, which I was thinking about literally just showing you some of this stuff, but maybe it's a little bit much. If I find like a short enough clip at some point, I'll, I'll pull it up for you. But you know, and I'm, cause I'm not, not, I'm not sure you need to see any of this stuff or all of this stuff, (laughs) definitely not all of this stuff about Mormon transhumanism, but there really are some interesting people here that are talking, talking about some pretty interesting ideas. Uh, and trying to demand spirituality or something to be involved with this. But apparently, you know, there's also people that aren't even Mormon that are talking in these conferences because it's like they're Mormons working towards transhumanism and Mormonism to them is like a bigger thing because they acknowledge that there are a lot of different churches beyond just the uh, main Brigham Young church, even though it seems like that's the one that they're trying to vie to be the most associated with. So there's a bit of mainstream acceptance by the Mormon church of the Mormon transhumanist association. So I don't know. That's, that's pretty crazy. Pretty sweet. I don't know about crazy. It's pretty rad. Pretty rad. That's what I mean as a Californian. Excuse my confusing lingo. All right. This was the title I was using for the video to see if I could get away with uh, my video. Let me just really quickly check. Uh, cause I, now I'm going to see if that really mattered at all. Um, how's this working? Monetization? Yeah, request review. Alrighty. Yeah, so I'm still going to have to request review. I mean, I definitely should have. By the way, I def. Oh, hey, Katie, thank you for becoming a member. That's ironic. Right as I was worried about that, I was like, yeah, because the last video I have up from yesterday is still yellow. Like, they don't want my videos to be in green to make cash and make it worth it. And they're just trying to be horrible to me, and it's sad. And I was hoping that they were going to stop doing that. So it's a bummer. So yeah, Katie, thank you for that. That's pretty sweet. Anyway, you probably wanted to know how to make a TV. I did. I was always worried if I was on a desert island, what would I do? How would I make that TV? You know what I mean? I mean, and then I was thinking to myself even, not that was like when I was six. Like if you were on a desert island, you want to have a TV. Let it go for a while. But then I get to the point where I'm older and I'm thinking to myself, Man, what if I was, uh, you know, like after a reset, I remember being like 19, 16, I forget, some teenage years, 
If I was on a desert island and I couldn't make a TV and society collapsed because of me because I could have learned, right? If I had learned how to make it, because you remember that movie, The Postman? And I really wanted to be somebody in The Postman and I wanted to be able to save the world, you know, by like making some advancement or remembering some advancement, like because we forgot more than we we'll ever learned about whatever. So the point is you can make a TV and there's a lot of different ways to make a TV, but the real problem is trying to get like a circuit board that produces lights and you can do that. You can make like a 64 panel grid that produces lights and have RGB uh, grid lights. And it arguably will be easier to produce that eventually, but a cathode ray tube with a certain projection chip is it's, it's really difficult to get the, to the angle, right. And to make a chip that actually picks up on the electrons probably worth understanding how that works, but we're going to talk about a whole different thing today. You'd think that was what I'm going to talk about. It's like I psyched you out. You know, no, this is about another thing called the NIPCO disc, right? And here's an example of the NIPCO disc. Uh, and you can do this with a laser or with a, you know, projector. And ironically, that's how most projectors work. You have an LCD screen that's spinning in order to avoid the dust. And then, you know, because you can't focus on the dust if it's spinning, but you can just see like the clear glass. And then the light that shines through the projector is onto an LCD panel. So, boom, rotating disc, uh, LCD panel. Is this exactly right? Yeah, let me just do uh, LCD projector. Uh, what's it called? LCD chip. Um, well, you know, basically this is the same thing as a TV screen. It's a tiny little chip that has all the pixels in a small space and then light shines through it because of course, but it, it's so much light and it hits a mirror and then it bounces that through light. And that's how you get the projection of this pixelated chip. So that's the difference really. When you compare that though, to the the seventies and eighties, you had more of that other kind of thing I was looking at right here this NIPCO spinning disc and the images you'd get like here for instance you could actually have a TV with 32 lines right and 32 and you eventually get 320 lines it was 280 to 320 but they had this in like the 30s and the 20s and the you know the, the aughts the, this technically existed in some respect electrons that had a number of lines and each one of those lines is really an electron running or a, you know, a photon, whatever it's like a piece of light, a, ser a chain of lights running across the screen and skipping steps occasionally. And you end up seeing that so quickly happen. And you, someone did this before and you can watch it when they slowed down Mario brothers to like 10,000, uh, one ten thousandth of, of a nanosecond or whatever the heck it is. You know, you can watch, it's maybe like 32 thousandths of a second. You can watch the pixels on the screen appear dot by dot by dot by dot. It's literally not line by line. It's dot by dot like Pac-Man running across the screen and making the new image. And so that's basically how TVs work to an extent. Not, not full explanation, but a little bit. Let me jump into this article about it. 3D printed. You can already see what's going on here. And you saw that. But all right. Someone's going to explain this better than me. Before flat screens, before even cathode ray tubes, people watch television programs at home. Thanks to the NIPCO disc, right? Yeah, NIPCO disc. 90 years ago in places like England and Germany, broadcasters transmitted to commercially produced black and white electromechanical television sets, such as the Baird televisor that was used, uh, that used these discs to produce moving images. All right, so here's the Baird televisor. Spins a plate. You guys probably remember watching some kind of a thing that does this. Pretty sweet. All right, Bell televisor. But imagine electronically sent through the radio radio based fax machines instantaneous almost faxes that you can see the fax over and over again i mean right the nipico disc pretty sweet so early program established many of the new formats for grant take for granted today nipco disc made a display with more than a few dozen scan lines and practice and practicable 
uh, in stark contrast to modern screens with thousands of lines, but when a mechanical TV is fed a moving image, the result is surprisingly watchable. And NIPCO displays are fascinating in their simplicity. No high voltage or complex matrices. So I wondered what's the easiest way to build such a, de a display that could produce a good quality image. I'd been interested in NIPCO devices since I was a student, trying a few experiments with cardboard discs that really didn't produce anything. In more recent years, I saw a number of people had built modern NIPCO displays, even incorporating color. But these relied on having access to pricey machine tools and materials. I set about designing an inexpensive version that could be made using a consumer grade 3D printer. So, you know, remember, you know, if someone says like, you know, you're on a desert island, what do you want? You know, probably maybe a 3D printer because you can make plastic out of a uh, coconut oil. The lipids. So the secret of the Nipco disc is in its spiral of holes. A light source between the disc illuminates a small region and sp motor spins the disc and each hole passes through the lighted region in turn creating a series of slightly curved scan lines. If the illumination is varied in sync with the time it takes each hole to cross the viewing region, you can build up images in the display frame. The first thing I had to do is figure out the disc. I chose to make the disc 20 centimeters in diameter as that's a size most home 3D printers can manage. This disc dictated the resolution of my display. Since there's a limit to how small you can produce precisely shaped and positioned holes, I was I wrote software that allowed me to generate test discs with my Prusa printer, settling on 32 holes for 32 scan lines. The display is a trapezoid, 21.5 millimeters wide, 13.5 millimeters tall. Okay, you get the point. And here's the disc, here's the, the Adreno to run the disc, and you can get the 3D printed files here, actually. At some point, we'll have to start printing some stuff, because this looks like something worth printing. For light source, use an LED module with red, green, and blue elements. Place behind a diffuser. A good picture requires a wide dynamic range of brightness and color, which means driving each element with more power and precision than a microcontroller can typically provide directly. I designed a 6-bit digital to analog converter circuit and had custom printed circuit boards made, each with two copies of the circuit. I stacked two PCBs on top of each other so that one copy of my DAC drive one LED color uh, with a spare circuit left over in the in case I made any mistakes popping the PC board with components. This gave a combined resolution of 18 bits per pixel. Three poten potentiometers let me address the brightness of each channel. An Arduino Mega Controller provides the brains, enough RAM to hold screen frames, and enough input-output pins to dedicate an entire port to each color. A port allows you to address up to eight pins simultaneously using the bits of a single byte to turn each pin on or off. Okay, so they can turn on the lights and colors and make, you know, a, a fraction of red and green, you know, mixed together. Or you know, probably a better choice would be blue and green or blue and red, but whatever. As this spins, you can only see it at certain times. And because it's running back and forth like a vinyl record, but not really because it's zigzagging back and forth, but whatever, you get a line. A vertical um, spinning from this horizontal gives you a horizontal line, right? The vertical spinning gives you the horizontal line. It's not quite vertical, but you get the point. It is vertical in a certain sense. So here's a little look. Whoa. Let me see here. Let me, uh... Yeah. I don't want to. I'll just skip ahead. Boom! There are there's a TV there pushing out data. It's in the smallest amount of data possible, and yeah, of course, pretty low resolution, but that's pretty impressive, right? Like to build a TV that you can use on an island if you ever get stuck, and yeah, you can basically build this out of things you find on a desert island if you had a 3D printer, which is, you know, you could basically build a 3D printer if you had stepper motors, and that's the hardest part. Stepper motors, but you can get stepper motors out of a dump. So if you lived in a dump, you'd definitely get this done. That's pretty cool. So that's kind of how you build a TV, man. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. That's, that's kind of that's kind of what that TV thing was about. That was the point. Well, there's more I want to show, share with you, though. Let me show you this. Photonic... Um, photonic chip performs image recognition at the speed of light. Well, we just did that video talking about how that works, and now this data just came out. 
New photonic deep neural network could also analyze audio, video, and other data in what we would consider almost analog computation digitally because you'd have so many places to have each signal. It would essentially work almost analog in terms of high resolution. Not technically how it works, but, you know, it will be because of photonics. You'll have analog part density and spectrum. So the light into different waves of color is different than just binary pulses. You have at least uh, eight if not far more spectral, uh, you know, representations that can exist simultaneously and be metric simultaneously. You can send data in different spectrums of color. You can have a rainbow of data instead of a pulse of light. That's a thing. All right, deep neural networks that mimic the workings of the human brain now offer powerful compu computer vision, speech recognition, and much more. However, they are increasingly limited by the hardware used to implement them. That's been my problem, man. Things take a while to render. Now scientists have developed a deep neural network on a photonic microchip that can classify images in less than a nanosecond, roughly the same amount of time as a single tick of the kind of clocks found in a state of our electronics. In artificial neural networks, components dubbed neurons are fed data and cooperate to solve a problem, such as recognizing faces. The neural net repeatedly adjusts the link between its neurons and sees the resulting patterns of behavior are better if they're better at finding a solution. Um, over time, the network discovers which patterns best at, are best at computing results. It then adopts these as defaults, mimicking the process of learning in the human brain. A neural network is called deep if it possesses multiple layers of neurons. Although these artificial intelligence systems are increasingly finding real-world applications, they face a number of major, major challenges given the hardware used to run them. First of all, they are usually implemented using digital clock-based uh, platforms such as graphic processing units, GPUs, which limit their computation speed to the frequency of the clocks, less than 3 gigahertz for most state-of-the-art GPUs. So that's how long you get to ask a question. You, know, you have to wait a gigahertz. Three. That's not really how that works. This is funny. Um, <laughs> so uh, the limit of the speed is like, I guess, how, well, it, kind of. Because it's, it's how many questions you get to ask. How quickly? I don't know. That's not exactly how uh, floating out operational points work. But limits their computation speed to the frequency of the clocks. Less than three gigahertz for most. City of the art GPUs. Second... Unlike biological neurons, which can comp compute and store data, conventional electronic, sep uh, electronic separate memory and processing units, shuttling data back and forth between these components, wasting both time and energy. Ironically, we think the human brain might do the same thing because you have memories of smell that are separate from memories of sight, which means that, get this, the same memory is stored in five different places in your brain, which is ironic also because your brain can't feel anything and that's how all of those things work because you've got your eardrums your eyesight is photonic i mean everything is touch but you can't physically touch anything your brain literally can't and then everything is just empathy based so it's all just about like awareness of your nervous system which is just that's deep man all right which can compute and store data Raw visual data usually needs to be converted to digital electronic signals, consuming time. Um, it can classify an image in less than 570 picoseconds, which is comparable with a single clock cycle in the state of our chips. It can classify nearly 2 billion images per second. Um, but they got to go further, man. You know, a video frame is 24 to 120 frames per second. It can do 2 billion images per second. But that's just still not enough. One do more. So, I don't know. This isn't helpful enough to my point, but they're able to finally project light, have certain amounts of questions asked simultaneously, and so they'll be able to ask really important questions faster. And that's a big thing. Um, quantum entanglement. Do I want to do the quantum entanglement thing? I'll save this for, like, tomorrow. I got to have some stuff to talk about tomorrow. I do want to show you guys some stuff because I did tell you I want to talk about Amiga. So let me see if I can find that Amiga video really quickly without screwing this up. This is going to be so annoying to do this wrong. How do I do this? Um, can I? Hmm. This is like the worst thing ever. Huh. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Trust me on the. Uh...
no. Start. Wait. Yes. No. 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 Okay. Um, add a video. Add a file. Is this it? Yeah. Cool. All right. And I put that at the top. And this will be the first thing I play. And I'll be super happy I did. Right. So drag that up to the top. I know. It's like you're sitting in the dark wondering if it'll ever exist. that is around anywhere in the world. The professional machine of the future. How would I describe it? I think it's fantastic. Awesome. It's going to skyrocket. Only Amiga makes it possible. Amiga's got the guts to do things that you can't do on other hardware. And it does all the work for you. Wow. State-of-the-art technology at a price that everybody can afford. The Amiga is the best graphics machine available in the world today. Only Amiga. 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 Only Amiga makes it possible. Only Amiga. Outrageous. Makes it possible. Only Amiga makes it possible. Makes it happen. That's what it is. Yeah, right, right. Uh, I'll take that. That's basically the point. So that was Amiga. Um, only Amiga makes it possible, and that's a beautiful song. And what that's about, really, is this computer that existed in the 80s. So I'm going to go into further detail and play like a 10-minute video in a minute that's about the video toaster that explains a little bit more. But there's a few videos I'm going to show you right now, including Disney explaining what the multicam uh, camera is, because that's also important to this whole story about technology and like how technology's evolved and what we're working with here so why we have the ai that can draw for you which is cool right so first thing you had the multicam system and that was a bunch of plates and i'll show you that and then the next thing you did was you had a system that was uh digital because it would make geometry mapped with those computations that we were just talking about a second ago and you can use those geometry maps in order to make models because you can project those with computers right and you can literally that's how you have models right because you can say hey this is this geometry of um a relative point and fractal point and we're literally just using math i mean everything is math and that's that's what comes up over and over again i'm gonna show you a pretty crazy video from the 70s about that um but yeah, so the video toaster. So the video toaster eventually existed because there were wired video machines that could take in video input from those kinds of television systems and they could record the electro electronic um, signal into magnetic tape using iron oxide on these film strips, which would then have magnets would then with this little needle, kind of like a record needle, but it would just move across the thing and get electrical and then an electromagnetic pulse would then magnetate the, um, 
magnetize the uh, tape. And so that's why you have electromagnetic tape. And they had big tapes, big tapes that are like inches thick and wide, and it was crazy. And that was the beginning of some of that uh, sound first, and then video was able to be recorded with the tapes, and you see the technology going on. But it wasn't all digital. It wasn't all digital. Because we think of digital stuff, and it it's this like, is it is you is or is you ain't a pixel, right? Are you, is, you, are you, is you is you ain't a red pixel? No. Is you is you ain't a green pixel? Well, yes. Yes, I am. And you might have a hard time asking that about yourself, but when you really ontologically get down to it, that's all you're asking. You're asking millions and billions and as many questions as you can to really say, is this pixel pink? Is No, it's, it's, it's not, not even really pink, but what does that mean if it's pink? Well, it means it's made up of red and green. And so, you know, you start to break down these ideas and you're like, wow, people are really red and green and blue, right? That's all there is to it. Like the only kinds of people that exist are red, green, and blue people. You know, as far as I can tell, because we're all made of light. <sighs> okay, so there's that. And uh, Amiga was different because it was an analog to digital systems. So you have a digital computer that does all the math digitally and it's doing this like clockwork thing with a crystal inside of it. And we'll have to go into that a little bit later. Because, you know, who cares? Not not everybody cares, and I feel like I don't even know what you guys care about sometimes. I want to allow to talk about, and it's all confusing because those are all different questions. But um, the Amiga, I'm trying to focus on that. It took inputs from actual video systems. So you could have four VCRs plugged into a computer, right? Or you could have a camera, or th four cameras, or you could have some combination of VCRs or cameras you know, video inputs plugged into the, you could have sine wave if you want it, but whatever you could, you know, video inputs. And what it would do is, and there are still analog machines like this today, but they're less common. Like TriCaster doesn't make them more, but like for thousands of dollars, like hundred thousand dollars in 1968 or something, you could take a video signal in and it could magnet type, you know, a t the tape or the output, or even just doing the same thing using those, um, transistor based circuits to create LCD panels, which is not quite what it was. It wasn't really a liquid crystal panel, but it was a uh, carbon, uh, there's sometimes feral, 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 uh, feral fluidic uh, carbon was used in some of the early LCDs, which I got, I got to do a thing on the buck, the buck cryogenic computer. That's a whole other thing. I, I, eh, so much, so much point is, this computer was smart because it could connect to your VCR and your camera. All right. Okay. That's what you, that's all you really need to know. And instead of having to use like right now, you've got this computer that has a chip inside of it. And even that chip they figured out has like different chips inside the chip, right? Even though it's just copies of bigger chips, they're all different chips. And that works better because having one chip, which is what we did for a minute there with the 386, one chip, one city to run it all. just doesn't work very well. It's, it's okay. It does. Windows 95 is impressive. You know, Windows 3.1 is impressive. But having um, tandem uh, computer chips and having multiple different systems that are running and having hyper threading and CUDA, you know, and that's one of the ways that this uh, AI stuff is possible is you're able to have a question. Um, so you have to imagine what is it that we're doing here, right? So I'm asking AI a really simple uh, question, right? It's really simple for me to ask. The question, it's just hard to answer, right? I'm asking AI a question that's like very short to answer. It's like, I ask AI, what's the meaning of life, right? Very easy for me to ask that question. It's a short question. What's the meaning of life? It's a hard question for AI to answer. It's a hard question for anybody to answer. It's not that hard um, in the sense it's non, it's, it's non-trivial, but there's math and it will take time. And there are certain questions that have to be answered in order to answer that question. And those questions might take time and they have to happen sometimes in certain order in order to make sense. Right? So there's a certain amount of time it must take, even if you're going to do all the questions at once and ask all the questions, answer all the questions about what the meaning of life is. It's still going to take you a lifetime of lifetimes. You know, because you have a million lifetimes, billion, infinite lifetimes all happening at once. It's still going to take an order, you know, the order of operations still has to happen. So that's important. And you might still need certain lives to happen before other lives in order to have reflection. Who knows exactly how time works? AI might know. That's going to be funny. I mean, you saw what they do with the turtle and the, the elephant. Okay, so Amiga, pretty important stuff. Uh, they introduced a VCR-based computer system that would then pick up signal from analog, and you could then record out to your VCR. So rather than having digital pixels stored somewhere, it would take the camera feed, you'd add your visual effects, and then it would 
you know, it'll play it out. Um, man, you know what? I'll just show you again. Hold on. Since the home computer boom, life has become simpler for many Americans. Here he is, the one. Okay. Every transition, every transition. Digital effect, digital effect. What? Graphic, the sound? graphic. Duh. Okay, we got this. Every transition, every transition, digital effect, digital effect, graphic, graphic, title, title, and animation, and animation you're about to see, you're about to see, was created entirely with the video toaster, the video toaster. Oh, the sound's off. Oh, man. There's just so much chaos going on right now. Wait. Every transition, every transition, digital effect, digital effect, graphic, graphic, title, title, and animation, and animation you're about to see, you're about to see, was created entirely with the video toaster, the video toaster from New Tech. Remember how it used to be? In science, they call it a paradigm shift. Yeah, a paradigm. What? what what's that? One historical moment. The sun revolves around the earth yeah the next moment enter copernicus wasn't he polish and voila same as Chopin. the earth revolves around the sun shows you how things can change right now this very moment as we speak a paradigm shift of equal magnitude has grabbed the world of video a paradigm shift and the force behind the shift. We at New Tech call the Video Toaster. Hey, that's a hot name. Yeah. And we assure you, once you've seen what our toaster can do, I'm ready. The world of video will never look the same again. years for the computer to evolve from a garage-sized shrine to a desktop tool. But with the video toaster, it happened as quick as snap. We're not talking evolution here. We're talking revolution. Yeah. See, way things used to be before the toaster, it took a room full of very expensive, complex equipment to make video that looked like real television. And the high price of these very essential tools kept the power of quality video in the hands of a privileged few. That is any for you, bud. Too expensive. But some very with it guys with good high tech brains did something about it. Decided to change the rules. They worked round the clock for four years to invent the new technologies. They invented the video toaster. Yeah, like the name. The toaster captures all the power and all the quality of a $100,000 network video studio and puts it on your desktop for well under $5,000. That's incredible. 
It is incredible. It's also unique. Hmm? There's never been anything like it. The world's first video workstation. That's what it is. Putting the power of video in the hands of the people. People like you and me. And like I said, with the toaster, it doesn't take a lot to get started. What do I need? Productions can use a camcorder as a live video source. To record your work, just plug the toaster output into your VCR. With the Video Toaster, video production is as easy as clicking a button. Hey, I can do that. Add a couple of cameras, you can have up to four, and you're into it. Doing video just like the networks. There's the four input switcher. Four input switcher. Switch, switch, switch. Look what it can do. It's the world's most advanced production switcher. Any switcher lets you perform cuts, dissolves, and wipes between video sources, but the toaster lets you do organic wipes that you won't see anywhere else. And there's digital video effects. Digital video. Digital, digital video, video effects. effects. Before the toaster came along, digital video meant you had to have deep pockets for big budgets. Not anymore. Now, with just the click of a mouse, you can generate hundreds of real-time video effects. Like what? Like what you see on television. Hey, neat. <laughs> Not bad. I can do this in my own studio. This is great. The video toaster can take you beyond the realm of effects way beyond, into the realm of uh, video illusion. Hey, just what you need <laughs> for the soul of rock and roll. How do I do that? With chrome effects. Chrome effects? Chrome effects. Chrome effects. See? With the toaster's unique chrome effects color processor, you can set a moody mood or set your video on fire. Hey, hot stuff. Then there's toaster paint. Toaster paint. Toaster paint. Toaster paint. Toaster paint. Look what it lets you do. And you don't have to be an artist to do it. Spectacular network quality graphics. Just grab any frame from your camcorder or VCR and get into toaster paint. You can manipulate the images like that? Yeah, and then display them in one of the toaster's dual frame buffers. You can perform image miracles. Anything else I should know? There's the luminance key. Luminance key. Luminance key. What does that do? The luminance key lets you insert one video source over another. Like a person on camera, over a toaster paint graphic. Or even over live video. Is she in Kansas or what? <laughs> Where else? And there's a character generator. What does that do? Well, you've seen how they use it on the news. Names, titles, information printed on the screen. It can do that? Beautifully. There's a character generator built into every toaster. That's good to have. The pros call them CGs. And this one has everything a pro expects. It's got it all. We've got it all, so you can have it all. In one box. I can go into production right away. And why not? Thousands of toaster owners have seen the light, just like you. Toaster video power at your fingertips. This is the basic setup, huh? Yeah. With this all-in-one desktop system, you can create the coolest videos on your block. You can use it for training videos, promotional tapes, school events, weddings, even divorces. Or you can simply create. I can start up my own production company. Yeah, you sure can. Add two VCRs and an editor and you have a full-blown post-production suite. This is what I call a video revolution. That's just what it is. And here's another reason why. Lightwave 3D. Lightwave. With Lightwave, you have the excitement of three-dimensional graphics. How's it work? Easy. You begin by creating wireframe models with the Lightwave modeler. Yeah. Then you use the Lightwave renderer to give it three-dimensional life. Hey, that looks real. It's real, all right. Real easy. You're the director, the next Walt Disney. <laughs> you position objects, camera, and lights just by sliding the mouse. Then, when you're ready, Lightwave will animate your scene just like this. Or like this. Neat. Or this. <laughs> Crazy. Or this. Yeah. And all this is included in the price of the toaster? You bet. It's each separate piece of production equipment that you need to make real broadcast quality television. Combined into one device with one easy to use interface. I've heard so much about this. Now you know why. It's changing the world of video forever. You see, when New Tech created the video toaster, 
Our goal wasn't to be as good as, it was to be better. It wasn't just evolution, it was revolution. A leap, a shift. Yeah, the paradigm shift. So buckle up your seatbelt, Jack, and open up your mind. And let the video toaster take you places you've never been before. So, so I think Benevolent Dream was saying um, that he thought that Lightwave is old, or you know, he said Unreal Engine, and that's true. Unreal Engine's amazing, but you know, Lightwave still exists. Uh, kind of feel like bringing it up because why not? Let's see, Lightwave 3D. Wow, it's like I've already got the wiki page like recently has been opened in my life ever. So Lightwave 3D stable release 2020. May 2021 um, stable release, and there are this is again stable release, so it continues to happen. And new tech still exists. Amiga was the old thing. I have a new tech TriCaster from like 2001, which is like you understand, it's still one of the crazy greatest computers ever made in, Can in Topeka, Kansas, because it's each computer chip in the TriCaster is like the it's about a foot a square foot each chip and each chip has physical cards which are now you could digitally do all the things you could do on this system easily but for years you couldn't you know and even then it's analog because it's really these are i mean to an extent because these chips are specifically working on their goals and software can emulate that and we'll argue about that in the future but dude litech is amazing so what is you know lost Battlestar galactica titanic Star Wreck, Avatar, you know, you want to see like movies that use Lightwave, Avatar use it. So it's not an Avatar 3D and so it's not a forgotten software. It's a still very important software. So don't worry, um, did not go anywhere. But Amigas were important because you could use this technology and then Apple just completely displaced them. I don't think I'm going to do the story today, but another time we'll tell the story of Pirates in Silicon Valley, a great movie you can watch anytime you want. I think Odyssey's got it somewhere, but look for Pirates in Silicon Valley and I'll tell you the story of Venrock, Venture Rockefeller, and capitalism because you have Venture Rockefeller took over through Park Research Labs. And I think I've told this story before, but Park was created at some point. The military needed, you know, central tabulating companies to build international business machines. CTC became uh, IBM. IBM did this because of census work back in the 1890s or something into the 1920s and 30s when they completely solidified as a full on. That's all they do. And IBM overtook CTC because they used to before that CTC made type re um, cash registers. So cash registers, they started, um, yeah. And by the way, can you use Lightwave to make games? Yeah, can you use Cinema 4D and Blender and uh, add them to you know video game engines? Uh, depends, you know, what you're talking about. But yeah, you know, I mean, like Blender has an engine that you can work with Lightwave. And Lightwave was used to make lots of games over the years and past. Um, it's for model making, though. It's, you know, you make the models and you add rigs to them and use that in some sort of a character animation system. Whatever. That wasn't the point. What was I trying to say? I don't hear what I was talking about. Um, anybody, you can remind me. I'll go back to it. But uh, Lightwave, software, 3D. Eh, computers, whatever. So you can, you can imagine, though, like this technology, how did this happen? Look at Disney. And uh, Disney was already using stuff that became this. And you might be saying, wow, crazy. 80s technology was so advanced. How is it advanced? Like today, it must be more advanced. But a lot of times you're just doing the same things, physical things. Um, 
yeah, someone saying rendering 3D images took hours or days. It took a lot less time than you might think when you had a bunch of analog physical computers, right? People that were making the Fry's electronics commercials. Yeah, it might take like a few days or something like that. But yeah, okay, so you build up what you want it to do, and over the weekend, it, it programs it. So it is chill. It's cool what it is. But oh, yeah, thank you. Mostly con unconscious said IBM, IBM headquarters. So IBM then was said to... Uh, you know, they needed, so there's already a military grade park research lab that existed before IBM that purchased CTC. It was using CTC financed it because they needed CTC's money because CTC was involved with the cash register thing. And also the fact they can manufacture and they had been around Eli Whitney's period uh, using standardization and multiple uh, standardization practices became very important that IBM practiced. So that's how they came out of a cash register company and started doing the census work. And you can look up IBM and uh, the Third Reich, and you can see that the 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 num the IB IP numbers that are on people's arms, whatever is true about IBM and that, you know, you can look, you can look into that. It's pretty interesting that IBM. Um, there's a lot of evidence that IBM was involved with, but of course they'd have to be because they were doing census work. So is what it is so they needed a printing system for their machines right to print all this stuff and so the government said we need that and they said oh, i don't really want to build printers so we gotta so they came up with a way to build printers and that was to the park research lab and they said we don't want to run a printer company well we need these printers to exist so they spun it off and the military created by making ibm create a product that they needed xerox and so xerox cr created theoretically or in it, it, it adopted park research lab and really it becomes more relevant in the 20th century through park research lab through xerox xerox produces the mouse clicker ux system where your screen has objects that can be uh, selected this whole system is developed by them theoretically and that starts to emerge but what we don't know is that the uh, system was developed at the time to have Ethernet. You know, I know this because my ex-girlfriend's dad like worked for um, 3Com, and was all his whole life was about Ethernet. And Ethernet's still very near and dear to my heart, right? And even the name Ethernet. But Ethernet let you do this thing where you could connect your terminal to a bigger computer system that was super powerful. And so you might say, oh yeah, well how could they? No man, like you have a giant computer or a bunch of computers connected and you send it this code. Again, the question can be really short. How, what's the meaning of life is a short question. The answer might even be short. 42 is a very short answer. Um, but the work that it takes to understand and process all that could be done on a, a, a big iron system. And that's what was going on in that period. I'm gonna show you another video now. Um, let me see if I can get it to work properly, because that's... Okay, one second. Let me skip to this guy. Uh, Multiplane generated video toaster. Every transition, every transition. Digital effect, digital effect. Graphic, graphic. Uh, title, title. And animation, and animation. You're about to see, you're about to see. Was created entirely with the video toaster, the video toaster from New Tech. Okay, all right, we 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 got the we got this, we got this. All right. Uh, I hate when they have music at the beginning of stuff because that screws me up every time. I'm going to turn down the music and hopefully that'll be fine because I don't want to deal with that yet. Um, they're probably going to get me in trouble and be like, you're not allowed to have that music. And it's like, I don't even want that music. That music is ridiculous. But this is one of the earliest films uh, created by a computer, right? Back in like 1970, 1974 or something like that from the University of Utah. And you can look into Utah's involvement with technology. But I think if I showed you Mormon transhumanism earlier. You get the point that uh, it's a thing. But this is a hand, not a real human hand, but a hand that was animated in 1974 or something like that in the University of Utah. Uh, and it shows you a pretty decent rendering of a human hand done digitally. And you're like, what? How the heck do they have a VR, AR, 1970s hand? Well, you know, um, here's how, right? So they took the hand and they put a model up and this is exactly what they're doing now to an extent. But polygons were drawn on the model in order to make it easier to map the distances. You know, this is um, 
It's amazing that they were able to do this. I think it's just so impressive, really. But they knew exactly what they needed to do. I think that's what they ended up deciding. Like, what does a computer understand? And they re and they translated the data to the computer. So, again, the connection between Utah and Disney is interesting because you can think of Don Bluth, but there's so many people that came from Utah that were involved with Disney. And yeah, I mean, so then using a camera uh, and using a stepper motor metric system, it was able to measure the sculpture and boom. Isn't that crazy? Look at that. So <laughs> 70s wireframe mesh hand um, from Utah. There it is. There's your first hand. And this guy went on to work at Pixar which Disney, I'm going to show you another clip in a bit that's on Disney and how they got involved with Amiga. Rather, how Amiga, they, they bought a company to build Disney Animations, which became Disney Interactive, which, you know, worked with uh, Sega eventually to make the Lion King video game and now owns Lucas Entertainments and everything. So, pretty wild stuff. I don't know. I mean, the hand being able to move based on a model of a non-moving hand is also interesting because by having the metrics of the polygons, again, this is generating information to create a hand that bends its fingers. They're not necessarily bending their finger. It just knows how to bend a finger because it has a finger. Hey, Bobcat, thank you. Did you know when the digital camera was invented. It was not released because it was being used by the NRO and the Keyhole Series spy satellites. Well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. My um, grandfather at Lockheed worked on digital uh, memory storage and cassette tape and uh, video, uh, you know, amongst other things. And one of my good friends um, might not want to be named. <laughs> His father was a Lockheed guy who did video to replace film because in the 60s it was so expensive to, to do these film processes from these uh, satellites, right? These overhead satellite systems that were going over Russia. So they're still in our atmosphere and they had planes and they had guys in these planes. They're flying over Russia and they're trying to get these pictures. It took a whole team to develop photos and then to radio them back or to deliver them instantly was like, so video was the answer. And they started working on how can we do this? How can we do what's going on here? Um, are these messages in the comments? Okay, guys, be careful with your comments. Um, Melissa, I don't know what. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, don't, don't, don't say that right now. I guess. But yes, Philip K. Dick was kind of an early prodigy of what eventually the Adderall generation uh, you know, emulated. Here's a facial polygon map taught to do. And you can see how this technology was used and Lightwave eventually developed out of it. Pixar developed out of it uh, using free code. You know, in the early days, code was shared around. Look at this, right? With an actual uh, skin placed over the designs. And this stuff got into what Tron eventually did. But this is literally better because Tron had to use actual animation. It was done by hand in certain respects. So pretty crazy, I think, that they could do this in the 70s. But going into video in the 50s, yeah, we know that television existed. Trying to uh, transmit video from space that was in color, I mean the cameras that were designed to go direct existed in the 50s, right? In the 40s and 50s. So you could say, yeah, the NRO keyhole series spy satellite cameras were probably more advanced because the giant lenses that had to bring in light as opposed to the keyhole LED um, CMOS chips cameras were not released to the public probably for like 30, 40 years after they were developed, which is kind of interesting. But, you know, at the same time, is that true? Because in some respects, they were. Like, Japan had cameras. There's bigger cameras. All right. Well, there's that. And then let me see if I can find the next thing. Um, hold on. 
All right, so the next thing is to talk about multiplane cameras and how Disney had multiplane cameras and you know the, the importance of that because the way that works is you take an image and you take another image and you stack them on top of each other and you have a camera that takes a picture of the plates that move. You know what? I'll just let you watch the thing. It makes the most sense. Now, this is a different kind of drawing. It also came out of our school of self-improvement here at the studio. It is the blueprint of a piece of equipment designed to make cartoons more realistic and enjoyable. This is the plan for a super cartoon camera. We call it the multiplane camera. It was intended for use in our feature length cartoons. You see, we decided for features, the camera needed improvement too. Actually, the pre-feature cartoon camera was fairly simple in construction and operation, and generally very satisfactory. Here, a Mickey Mouse short is being put on film. Mickey has been inked and painted on transparent sheets of celluloid. This happens to be a panorama effect where the character will walk in one place and the background keeps moving behind him to create the illusion. Each time a new cell of Mickey is photographed, the background must be moved a fraction of an inch. Photographing each one of these celluloids of Mickey and background makes a single frame of motion picture film. And here's how the action looks on the screen. Now note that our character is capable of giving us a real feeling of three dimensions. He can move farther away and come closer. He can turn so that we see all sides of him. He seems to have roundness. There's nothing flat about him. He can almost poke his finger in your eye. But when he leaves, uh, <clears throat> When he leaves, <laughs> when he leaves, whatever dimension he has given the scene leaves with him. Now, the unnatural flatness of the background becomes evident. But besides being merely unrealistic, the old fashioned flat background can also create a false effect. For instance, when our camera moves in closer on this moonlight scene, you'll notice that everything grows larger, including the moon. Now, when you walk along a country road toward the moon, it certainly doesn't grow larger like this, nor does it shrink in size when you walk away from it. The problem was how to take a painting and make it behave like a real piece of scenery under the camera. The trouble was we were photographing a flat two-dimensional background. So we set about making plans and blueprints for a new cartoon camera that would overcome this. The different elements in the scene were separated according to their varying distances from the viewer. This put the moon on a plane farthest away from the camera. With our original picture broken down in this manner, it is possible to control the relative speed with which each individual part of it moves to or away from the camera but the moon remains absolutely still, and so it will always remain the same, neither growing nor shrinking in size. Of course, our cartoon camera does not shoot sideways, but is placed above and shoots downward toward the drawing. Since this new camera used many planes, we called it the multiplane camera. And here now is our same moonlight scene, the way the multiplane camera sees it. As you can see, we finally got the moon to keep its proper distance. This trick of obtaining a feeling of real depth and dimension in our painted backgrounds was used extensively in the feature cartoons. 
Perhaps an outstanding example of this occurs in the opening scenes of our cartoon feature, Bambi. Here we see the multiplane camera crew preparing to shoot that scene. Here are the planes for that scene, each with its own separate part of the background painted in oil on glass. Each of these background planes is placed on one of the levels under the camera. Each plane is capable of moving in various directions. Here we see one being moved sideways. The camera operator looking down from the viewpoint of the camera sees all the levels combined as one picture. From his view, we can see how each level or plane can move independently of the others. Here, the operator of each level is bringing his particular part of the background into the right position to start the scene. But before the scene can be photographed, the camera operator must okay the setup. Everything's okay except the bottom level. What's wrong down there, Alan? I was moving it the wrong way, Dick. I'm taking it back now. How's that? Looks fine now. Okay, we've got that frame. Let's get set for the second exposure. In our frame-by-frame -frame method of photographing a cartoon scene, the feeling of depth is not actually too evident when the scene is under the camera. You might be thinking that it looks as flat as the old-fashioned type of cartoon background. In fact, it does while it holds still. The trick of the multiplane camera is movement. The point is that the video is moving, but really the camera's holding still and things are moving behind. You get the point. So that's that's a big part of the technology. Now, you kind of understand how it works. You're taking a picture and you're putting it somewhere else. And if you can do that at angles, you can warp the image. And this is how AI is, is doing it. It's taking the same information, all the math. It just knows so many of these equations and formulas that have been used by Photoshop to bend an image and things since these ancient you know, formulas that were used with a perspective, geometry, Euclidean shapes, and math. And that's, you know, that's kind of the point. Um, but then Disney was like, dude, we could do more. And they decided, what, what could we do? Well, we could probably, you know, get shapes, save them for later, get rigs of moving shapes, save them for later, recycle and reuse those shapes. And that became kind of a big deal. Let me see if I can get that to... Hold on. It's going to be great. I can make this work. Okay, so uh, we did the multiplane. We looked at the glove. Yeah, yeah, I think we're going to go with straight. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Cool. All right. I hope there's no music again or whatever happens, but that's what it is. Oh, somebody asked something. What was that? Ah, uh, do, 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 do. I'm going to play that again. I can't help myself. Um... What they say? Oh, does AI have passion? So I had a girlfriend once whose mother used to take pieces of paper underneath the stack of the printed paper because uh, when you run out of paper in the printer, you know, you, you usually have a few pieces left and it says put more paper in. And then you put the paper in so it never runs out, right? But she would take the paper at the bottom because the thing with the paper on the bottom, the bottom paper would just get like left there and new paper would come and the old paper would never get used. And that, that's the meaning of life for that paper, or existence, more importantly, for that piece of paper. So that piece of paper, you know, she'd move it to the top, and it would get used, because that was its purpose and meaning in life. And it just kind of, I think it kind of shows that ref ref reflective empathy that exists in humanity, because we're looking for the same thing. It's a pattern recognition system. So, I don't know, just... Little food for thought there about that. And there was another thing, but, uh, yeah, I forget. I don't know. 
machines that fast. Since the home computer boom, life has become simpler for many Americans. They can shop at home, bank at home, even do their own taxes. Best of all, according to Leonard Malton, those who want to can even make their own films. Leonard. Entirely true, John. When I was a kid, I was fascinated with animation, and I tried doing some of it at home with a friend using an 8mm camera. Only problem was, I couldn't draw that well. Well, there was another problem. I didn't have that much patience either. Well, now there's an answer to both of those dilemmas for would-be animators, young and old. A computer software package developed by, who else, the Disney Company. This is one way to get a cartoon image on your computer. But there's another way that's even more effective, using a new software package from Disney called the Animation Studio. I sat down with the man who developed this ingenious program, Reichhardt von Wolfschild, to see just how it works. I can create a circle, and when I move forward a cell, I tell it, move forward, lay down another piece of onion skin. When I do that, the previous cell becomes lighter. If I wipe or draw this in front of it, and then wipe this away, you can see I'm not affecting that previous cell. It's, it's locked, and I can do this over and over again here. And I'll do a better example of this by using the ellipse command because now I can stretch and squash my sphere. As it comes to the top of the arc, it begins to stretch. And as I come down from my arc, it's gonna hit the ground and squash. Animate. That's amazing. You can easily add sound from a library of effects and even color. Coloring it is really easy. Done. The package also includes existing animation from vintage Disney films, which allows you to copy or study professional character animation and see exactly how it's done. What we have is Donald, and he notices something, and then he jumps up and gets angry. Here's just five frames per second. So we can really study it. We can study it. This is being used by schools all over America, and kids are actually creating animations. They're making animations, and they're making their own Saturday morning cartoons. And here's proof, a finished short film created by some teenage animation students using the Disney software and a lot of imagination. Sit down and take your test. But I wanted to put this program to the ultimate test to see if the world's dumbest computer user, that's me, could still make something move. Oops. Well, there you go. Okay. Today, press the A key. All right. You did it. I just animated. Well, you got a ball coming right at the screen. Yeah. All right, so it's not Donald Duck, but it moves. Yes, it does. And animation is not just about drawing. It is about understanding movement, and that's what this package can do. I think it can really teach a lot. It sells for $129.95, and I think it's going to turn a lot of people on to the joy of animation. Learn it's important to keep your mouth shut when you're on the computer. <laughs> Otherwise, well, something could fly in. That's true, but that's what's <laughs> called staring agape. <laughs> Thanks, Leonard. Mm. Uh, what? I don't, I don't even get that one. So yeah, so that's that's kind of, you know, then you see that software that Amiga's introducing where you've got all of the sketches that humans have done, and they've been used to, uh, first off, ironically, and I should have shown this video, how Disney did that was rotoscoping to begin with, which I guess I, I, I'll go into rotoscoping pretty soon, like tomorrow or the next day, if I can care enough to. But basically, you record a video, like I said at the beginning of the thing, and you... you instead of using this program that traces one and learns how to draw everything in the same way, because it's like, okay, we'll have these shapes now, right? Fill it in like this other picture, and it'll have, I'll translate it into a cartoon. No, back then, you'd have a person, and they draw it every frame in between. And this came up because, okay, and I'm, I'm glad to bring this up, because Mind Unveiled did a video again about uh, cannibalism or, uh, you know, candy, the Willy Wonka, and it's a good video, it's funny. But uh, Willy, Won Willy Wonka, um, you know, and the the Roald Dahl stories. And it's important because there's a lot of context here. It's worth mentioning. Like Roald Dahl did write weird books about cannibal uh, candy um, made of human children, right? And he's this is, Willy Wonka is an internationalist who has pygmies and slaves and everything like that. And he goes into the other important thing that I, I felt like he needed to mention, which is the overt message of the story is about the seven deadly sins because you have these kids that are like, I want uh, greedy, you know, you've got wrath because um, Willy Wonka has got wrath and all these kids are being tested pride. He wants the ticket. So Charlie wants the ticket so bad, you know, and you know, it's a, or actually sorry, it's lust. He's lusting for the ticket. 
um, you know, the slothful boy, I, you know, whatever, the, whatever. You, this all is, a, it's very clear. You can look it up at Willy Wonka. But there's other stories, too. We brought up the witch movie, which is about the little kids turning into mice when they find out there's, like, a secret clandestine group of witches that are all bald, like John Malkovich. John Malkovich coming up again. I don't know. Great movie. Terrified me as a kid. I, as a Slav, personally, think that terrifying stories are great for kids. For me, especially as a kid, I would not trade for the world. Not I would not trade for anything. Uh, not ha- To have not seen more, to have seen less... God, that seems like the whole the like the ultimate terrible thing. Like hell is amnesia and Alzheimer's, right? To me, and so for as a child to not have those ideas to be able to process and think with, God, like that hurts. You know what I mean? And I see kids today that are so sheltered because they're protected from horrible things because there's such horrible things in the world. It's true. And the normal thing, the normalized things are the worst things. So trying to find the weird, interesting, cool stuff is hard. And then you have to be like, well, wait, is it subjective? Because maybe these kids don't need movies about children in Yugoslavia. I had a cartoon about a girl in Yugoslavia whose parents died in the bombing. And she was removing bricks from a train every day until eventually the train collapsed. But from the tr- the train bridge, moving from a bridge. So that when the train came over, it would it would destroy the, the mu- ammunitions. And I just remember this as a kid, like I was like four, you know, and to watch like these crazy, serious things um, that terrify you in a safe environment, if it's done right and it's the right kind of story, I think it's important. I think a lot of stories aren't. I think a lot of stories are horrible today, especially. But, you know, like you might think to yourself, should a kid see Back to the Future? Because there's like rape and violence in it. You know what I mean? Like, it's a serious question. Like, Star Wars. People's hands get cut off. Whatever. Like, these kinds of things matter, though. You have to... Kids are being told, oh, well, the world's so horrible. Should I not see anything? I don't know. That bums me out. So, Roll Doll, um, Netflix bought it. Everyone's like, dude, they are, like, woke agenda. Well, they're firing all their woke people, and they made the ver- the um, Project Ver- Veritas, whatever the heck it is, the uh, Verate, Pentaverate, Penta um... I think that's right. Pentaveret show. And so that's, you know, they're doing their better thing. And Roald Dahl, yeah, he wrote a lot of gnarly things like James the Giant Peach. His parents get killed by rhinoceri. You know, the world's rough, right? You know, and like teaching kids that things like horrible things happen uh, is important. So I don't know. Roald Dahl, that's a thing for me that I think is kind of like, I wouldn't take Roald Dahl away from kids. I think you should warn them that there are perhaps globalists making children into candy. For, you know, a uh, metaphor or whatever, right? Like, that's a good thing. So, just wanted to say that. And it's my own little tangent on that. But there was a reason. Wasn't there? Were we talking about something? Um, well, let me look at the, some knees law really quickly to explain something. So, someone else had asked about computations. And could AI feel things? AI could literally measure people's feelings all over the place and get general ideas of feelings the same way as pictures. And they would have stimulus connected to your Facebook logarithms, and that's what it's doing right now. It's studying emotional responses because it's, you know, a big, I think people miss this about Facebook. A big thing is training AI about your emotional responses. It's not just about hypnotizing you into buying crap. It's just that that's the best way to afford to teach you that. Anyway, you've heard of Moore's Law. Sun Knee's Law has to do with Amdahl's Law. You could, it's not quite synonymous, it's analogous, but you could say that the amount of computations that you do can be uh, sped up by doing more computations at once, right? So if I, do, if I ask uh, five questions at once, it happens faster because I can answer five questions at once, right? Except if it's if the wrong order of operations. If I'm asking a question that's like divided by... Uh, you know, if it's four plus two divided by six multiplied by seven, and then you know, add a minus in there, subtract. You just mix them up. The numbers are wrong. So you have to do. If you're gonna better metaphor, if you're gonna make a soup, right? You gotta boil the water before you put the pasta in, and you can't just put the pasta in with a fire on 
and then put the water on when the noodles are done. You know, you got to do it in order. You got to put the water in to soak the noodles. Processes have to happen. Okay. So lifetimes could be simultaneously happening and you could get all of the lifetimes done at the same time. If you wanted to, you could have every life that ever happened from the beginning of time to the end of time and every possible life in between. But here's the kicker. You probably would have to do them all uh, over a period of a lifetime because once you get down to it, the the time still takes a certain amount of time. It's still going to take a certain amount of time to do those initial order of operations. And those that cannot be, um, you can't speed that up. That's still going to take a certain amount of time. So how long does it take to compute all of existence? One lifetime. All right, there's your, there's your important lesson there. And this is a computational rule that's been further improved by Sun, Ni, Sun and Ni, um, in uh, China, but also it's been you know accepted in Europe and across the United States. I think in at least in California, we use the same law sequence time to solve W parallel time to solve W system. And you can you can imagine you know what this really has to do with is when you have that processes. You know, let's say you have all the processes power in the world, and imagine again back. So someone else asked, could, how fast was it to process that hand? If you have computers all over the world and you have these big di- data mainframe systems that the military ran that were as powerful as you know computers are today, even if they were giant, right? And we do have evidence that we had very powerful computers. You know, some people will argue about that because of the power of an analog computer. Uh, it could do more. A lot of people might say, well, we don't know if it could have because software didn't exist for it. Well, we know a lot of software did exist. So it becomes... I mean, at one point, I had a great video on how computers worked. I don't know if it's up. I'll have to look for the AT and T Bell Labs series, uh, the Bell Archives, and I think they took my video down because of like a copyright thing. Because they were like, "Dude, no, you can't use our archive footage." And I was like, "But it's literally how computers work." They're like, exactly, you know. So they don't want you to know everything about computers and how they had cell phones in the '60s and everything else like that. Because what's a cell phone? It's a freaking digital radio, right? So it sends more and we know more and more that that's just old technology that's been recycled over and over again. There was a point about the Bell Labs and the Sunny um, processy. Well, you know what? Good time to think about it will be after I play this next video. Let me just skip this part though. Hold on. There you go. So, all right. Also, that this this is the first digitally rendered Disney animation done by Lasseter. So, if you guys know Lasseter and Pixar and how he basically took over Disney, and Disney was trying to buy Pixar forever, and then they were gonna like merge with Pixar, and then Pixar basically bought Disney, and they still are. It's like it's complicated, but it was essentially. You know, yeah, that's how that went down. All right, that was my story. Psych, psych. Eh. All right. So you get the so the thing about that is you've, it's not very long. And that probably took like a week to render at the time. Um, and there's a little bit of cleanup there as well. But you can see like the framing and shapes of the architecture is being used to produce these shapes. That's the beginning of that in like 1982. That's 1982. So you can see how Disney's really affected. Um, animation technology over the years and rotoscoping and how it was used because Disney started out by videoing, I mean, filming people animating the thing. And then they were like, eventually they learned from that. They're like, well, how long does it take to walk across or how long does it take for a blade of grass 
to move in the wind, right? Well, it takes like 24 to 48 frames. Okay, now this is the thing I was going to talk about because of 101 Dalmatians, which I hope that Mine and Veil does something on that because that's messed up. They have a Dalmatian plantation. I'm a Dalmatian. Like from Croatian, Dalmatians, there's a plantation, which is clearly has to do with slavery. And we all know with the Mark of Canaan and the dog because, um, you know, Rome, Romulus and Remus and the, the third... You know, yeah, there's a lot we got to get into on like uh, 101 Dalmatians. That's a that's a deep spiral that I was going to go into. But we can say that the Roald Dahl thing is connects because looking at um, 101 Dalmatians, one of the main animators, and he was talking about Tim Burton who redid Willy Wonka and brought maybe some attention to some of the book more, which is probably a good thing because I think the book is important. Um, yeah, and Justin wants to say that Disney originally was made by Pixar. Well, if you look into the actual thing, eh, they bought the company that they established as Pixar. And then they controlled it, and they didn't know what to do with it. And then Steve Jobs got involved with it. And that's how it kind of spiraled out of the hands. Because, But, you know, you have to understand, nobody loses complete control of a thing. They still have like 2% or 4%, which is a limited investment in a thing. If it's less than 51%, you don't control it anymore. And that's what... Hollywood and Silicon Valley and Venture Rockefeller was all about and with Disney and Disney did that same thing. Okay. Look like with uh, Apple, they've got rid of Steve Jobs. They hired the Pepsi guy, the president of Pepsi who did the Pepsi challenge to take over Apple because they had enough money and control of the board. And that's why he continually moved to take over his company. That's why Elon Musk is working so hard to control all of the stock in his, in his companies as much as possible. Because if you have 51% of a company, you run it, and he understands that, and it's it's a bit cutthroat, really. I mean, it, it is what it is, you know. Um, and Justin is also saying Steve Jobs hated Disney. I mean, you know, it's not the Disney that he hated. It's the Eisner, right? So, I mean, Eisner was a really tough guy to work with, and he did some crazy stuff. There's a documentary worth watching called Waking Sleeping Beauty that was about working at Disney in the 80s and – how Eisner came in, changed everything, and he fired a lot of people, and people quit. Don Bluth walked off, and then he decided to destroy the animation studio. He completely, he's like, all right, the old buildings where you've been working since the beginning, disrupt it. I want it gone. And then he just put them in uh, camping RVs that they set up in like a garage part of town, and then they just ripped out everything and um, destroyed the studio so that he couldn't exist anymore. So Eisner did a lot of stuff like that. And he, you know, one time he's on a plane, he's looking at a bag of gummy bears and he's like, call Japan. We're going to make a show about gummy bears. You know, we don't need any more of this Disney, whatever we're, you know, maybe we'll change that. And he was thinking about spinning off the names of Disney. They were thinking about calling like Western pictures or something like that. But you know what? They kept the Disney name as well as producing TriStar touchstone, um, you know, all this crazy stuff that they did. So it's important to remember that Disney did all that. So Disney was one thing, and then Iger's another thing, and Lasseter's the next thing. And so Disney, you know, but yeah, Steve Jobs didn't like a lot of people. Steve Jobs was kind of a hard guy to deal with. Um, I had an ex-girlfriend also who, uh, I think I've told this story before, lived in, in Silicon Valley in Los Altos. She, like, got an apple out of his tree in, you know, like, high school, and he was, like, yelling at her, you know, because, like, yeah, hey, that's my apple, which is kind of fair. To be honest, but it was like, you know, you gotta understand what it's like in Silicon Valley with all this friggin' giant property and everything like that. But, you know, it's kind of ironic. I don't know. It just tells you a little bit about it's like a metaphor for Linux that's real, you know? Okay. Um, so then the next thing, though. Boom with the loud noises. Okay, let me see. Remove that. Um,. I think that's which one's this one that's gotta be the amiga video right is it the one hold on let me see
Welcome to Animation 101. This is a first course in animation for video based on the Amiga computer system. It's in two parts. The first part, we're going to get an introduction to the system and see some of the exciting animations that it's capable of doing. In the second part, we're going to go into detail on some of these animations that you've seen and show you exactly how they were made. And since the Amiga has a voice of its own, I'll let it introduce itself. Okay? Okay. But I saw what you did. I am an Amiga 2000 personal computer. My memory bank has been expanded to 5 megabytes. My speed has also been upgraded with an accelerator board. Why do they call you a 2000? I suppose it's my IQ. I can speak in a monotone like an ordinary computer. But why be ordinary when you can be special? Well, you still sound like a computer to me. Yes, but with a sound digitizer. Hold up a sound digitizer, please. Hey, how'd you do that? You're supposed to be the expert. You figure it out. Oh, yeah. Uh, he used the Votrax vocoder chip. Please. With a sound digitizer. I can sound like anyone I choose. Hey, that's my voice. Disgusting, isn't it? Well, at least I have character. Well, well you, you want character, Harvey? Well, well, how's this for character? Who said that? Well, I said that. What, what do you want? A, a program or something, for heaven's sakes? Not bad. In fact, that's pretty good. You want something really good? Come up and see me sometime. That's great. But we need to move on to something else now. Touch me there, big boy, and we're engaged. We really need to move on to something else now. Okay, maestro. You can select an instrument and play it on my keyboard. I like the flute. So you'd have to add a chip to your computer that would have the That's ability to right. store in memory now I'm gonna pick the these string tone section. frequencies. But eventually you could have tape memory and you could pull that to a magnet, a quicker memory. Let's try two instruments. An acoustic guitar on the top and a banjo on the bottom keys. It's also interesting that this is, again, like it's a one more guy. <laughs> well, that's fun, but it's time to move on to the graphics. Wait, I haven't played any music. Lower your voice. I haven't played any music. Okay, we'll take time for one quick piece. Oh, hey, it's exactly what I do with MIDI. 1980. He shows off every chance he gets. It's what I do best. <laughs> I'm sure some people seeing this tape have never actually painted on a computer. So we're going to take just a quick minute here to show a few of the very basic fundamentals of painting on a computer. Most people paint with a mouse. Now, if you're saying that doesn't look much like a mouse, okay, get yourself a dust cover to go on it. Wow, this And that'll guy. help that illusion. I'm going to use a split screen to show how the mouse works. Ordinarily, you paint by pressing the left mouse button and moving the So remember, the mouse this around. infers he can record his screen and put it on a split you can screen erase by pressing with his the machine. Right button. Or you can come down to the palette, select a different color. And you can paint with two different colors. These are the sizes of brush that you can select. That's yeah, a smaller one. 
These are the basic tools that you have to work with. We've been freehand drawing. You can also draw a straight line by marking the two points and it automatically draws in between. Or you can, mark, or you can draw a curved line. You can draw a rectangle or a circle or almost anything like that, whatever you want. And you can fill an area. Let's, let's fill this one with brown. Or you can fill with a series of colors, a gradient fill. And we have a pumpkin. Yeah, dude, this is better than MS Paint. For there are sure. two other <laughs> tools that I want to mention because they're very useful in uh, industrial videos and in almost any kind of animation programs. If you select the symmetrical tool, then everything that you paint will come out like a snowflake. So Photoshop, the whole Photoshop bar, the vertical Photoshop bar. And of course you can use the other tools along with that, like the fill. And if you happen to make a mistake, well, don't panic. Johnny number just five. Hit the undo button, and it will undo Ooh. the last thing you painted. You can also <laughs> clear the point. screen. And if you do that accidentally, hit undo, and it will undo the clear. I think AI a will understand that you can color undo cycling. Button a lot more. I'm sure you've sorry. seen moving lines. This is nothing more than color cycling. It's extremely useful in industrial programs. It can show the flow of hydraulic fluid in machinery. It can show radio signals from a tower. Yeah, it's true. They used to, though. And you, you kind of do. And it can Actually, show electric there, there fields around tool. a wire. There's all kinds of tools in Photoshop. These gears know illustrate the both tool. tools. The teeth on each but gear was painted with the help of the symmetrical tool. Kid, kid now, I've picks picked up the whole thing as a brush, and now I'm going to paint a straight line with it. Now I'll turn on color cycling. Oh, color you cycling? You get so an you're... idea of the power of some of these features. Yeah, yeah, I think I do. Company logos are very important to TV commercials and many types of video. Now it takes about five minutes to paint a logo like this. But once it's finished, it's easy to animate it or change the size and fill the screen with it or soften the colors and do a perspective. This makes a nice background for the original logo. So far, we've been working in the standard paint mode in high resolution, which allows only 16 colors on the screen at a time. Now, there's another paint mode called HAM, which stands for Hold and Modify, which allows 4,096 colors on the screen at a time. To illustrate, let's start with a digitized picture of the Grand Teton Mountains. We'll talk Nowadays, more about everybody digitizing wants to talk, pictures like they got in a something to say, but nothing comes out when they move we the lips. We could add fluffy Just white a bunch clouds of to the sky for a It's almost like moon. they forgot about kid pics. But let's see if we can completely change the mood of the scene. We'll add an overcast sky. Bruh, he's going to do, like, fake news right and here. And a little fog right here and there. What? This is 1980, guys. Fake fog? Really? Okay. Yeah, I like to show you guys this because, like, anytime I feel like I'm doing some hot stuff, just remember it's, like, ancient technology. <laughs> it was a cloudy day. <laughs> With a scene that spooky, we've got to have a monster. This video tutorial is probably 85, maybe. I don't know, someone said Sven says 1985. But I can show you, again, older examples of this technology before it's maybe got the demonstration tutorial. Like, this goes back to, like, 1979. I mean, you've got 1971 and 1974. Or 1969, even, is when they start doing some of the... You'll get 1971... 
uh, you've got already geometric pattern mapping in CAD, so, and CAD's already based on stuff that's existed in the 50s. So, I mean, in terms of UX tools, you're going to have to discuss amongst yourselves. Do you prefer UX that's digital because you had the UX where you have a mouse that can pick a Loch Ness monster up? Or a guitar system where you took cables and plugged a computer into another computer and had a knob and you'd move this guy around with a knob that was, you know, or several knobs, X, Y, like the Etch-A-Sketch knobs. You'd pick it up and move it around, right? That's what they had before the mouse. So what do we have? The Loch Teton Monster. Yeah, it's a real picture of the Loch Ness Monster. And oh, yeah. It's a monster without a pterodactyl. <laughs> All right, well, that one you probably could have used a better skin for. But the point's the same, right? Like, and, th and you could have seen a picture like this printed on the National We started Park. this scene with a digitized photograph. There are a lot of ways to digitize pictures. they are frame grabbers and scanners. But the method that I use the most is called DigiView. I bet As you, you can do. see, this is a black and white security type camera, but it will do color pictures because it uses a color filter wheel and it does a three color separation. What were we talking about earlier? You place the picture hmm. underneath it, turn on the lights, adjust it. And first you digitize the red. In lines. Dude, tomorrow I'm going to talk about Wi-Fi 7. Green. And then the blue. Now we can see it in full color. Of course, you can also digitize black and white pictures. Yeah. This is how Ted Turner did this color. stuff. All these colorized movies that came out. And make it look like a moonlight scene. Because Paramount and MGM auctioned their catalogs or off right before the VCR the was released. Make it look like a sunrise. Another feature that's particularly useful to us is the line drawing. And that's because that a lot point. of animators still prefer to do their original drawings on tracing paper, the old-fashioned method. Turner had a lot of tapes in the 70s already. They're placed on, on the systems. copy stand on standard animation pegs and digitized one at a time. After they're all digitized and saved on disk, then it's an easy matter to load them into a paint program. Ted Turner's a weird color. character. <laughs> Ted Turner's a very important person. And then set it in motion. For him. I wouldn't hate him. I, I hate him a lot less than a lot of other people. And you can even add a background. And once we finish an animation, then we need some way to get it on videotape. And that's where the Genlock comes in. This is the one I use. It's called Super Gen. It has so a Gen two Lock sliders will, on it. One will it fade will synchronize the, the frames. Imagine the that you had a fade bullet, the background your machine gun, and a propeller. You want to make sure you don't shoot your propeller. You need if a gen you fade lock. both of them together, and you have a dissolve. This is useful in a lot of ways. For example, in industrial videos, you can use graphics to show what happens inside machinery. It's also useful for home videos, like when your mother-in-law wants to see your vacation pictures, but you went to the French Riviera. How are you going to show that to your mother-in-law? With animation. Whoa. Mormons. Saved by the fig leaf. Whoa, saved by a fig leaf. Oh, man. Now we're going to do oh. a complete... Uh-oh. Oh, no. What have I done? Wait, wait. Let me jump ahead again. Idea now that you don't have to have a hundred thousand dollar computer system in order to do animation. As a matter of fact, with a personal computer like I have here, or even a smaller one, you can do a tremendous amount of animation right in your own home. As a matter of fact, you could even have your own TV station. What's the bear right in here? No, this is.
Thank you for joining us. This is Ram 3 News, and I'm Scoop Richardson. <laughs> Worldwide attention has been drawn to the pyramids <laughs> Scoop of Egypt, Richardson. where scientists have made a discovery which could shed new light on the origin of those pyramids. For that story, we go to our foreign Come reporter on. in Egypt, Abdul Richardson. Abdul? Thank you, Scoop. I'm standing <laughs> here at the edge of the Great Sahara Desert. And believe me, these pyramids are magnificent. Scientists have just made a new discovery here. They've discovered like, a new chamber in one of these CNN pyramids. CNN did not miss a beat. the chamber contains hieroglyphics never before seen. They say it may be weeks before they can decipher Bro, the true meaning life. of these strange characters. We'll follow this story closely until we can understand the true impact of the story. Reporting from Egypt, this is Abdul Richardson. The pyramids oh, the weren't moving. even... Somebody grab the camera. <laughs> Hold it. Oh, forget it. I'm out of here. Oh, that's too we real. We apologize for the technical difficulties in bringing you that story. On the national news, a mystery is unfolding in South Dakota. What is happening of Mount right Rushmore. now? <laughs> Several tourists have reported hearing strange sounds drifting down from the mountain. We have a crew on the scene there. They're going to zoom in with their cameras onto the mountain along with the long-range microphone, and see if we can pick up anything. Where's the team that can't be beat? Who are the guys they can't defeat? We're talking about dudes with lots of sense. It's got to be us, the president. Well, all right. Yes, Mormons right. invented trolling. It's the dry humor. I think I heard something, but I couldn't be sure. What will the weather be like? Wendy Richardson is standing by outdoors where the weather is happening. Wendy? That's right, Scoop. This is where it's happening. Today's weather picture is a puzzle any way you look at it. But after analyzing all the information, the pieces are finally beginning to fit together. There's a thunderstorm sweeping across the western plains. A twister has been sighted on the ground. Fortunately, the only injuries reported have been dislocated hips and a few damaged eardrums. And I'm not sure what that is, but it looks like a very large snake crawling from coast to coast. But the thing that gives us the greatest concern at this time is the entire nation is being pelted with baseball size white numbers. Wendy's weather has the seal of <laughs> approval of the Meteor Illogical Society. Win Wendy, I thought. Turning now to the local news, the giant ape, Bing Bong, is on the loose again and is creating havoc in the downtown area. <laughs> I'm so proud of them for doing this. It's like a, yeah, it's like proof. Do I get it? It's a joke. You could do this too, but seriously, guys, you wanna? CNN would totally that respond. That wraps up the news for Bing today. Bong was I'm Scoop Richardson for Ram 3 News. When the news counts, count on Ram 3. But Ram, guys. Well, if television is not your thing, what you really want to do is make a movie. Go ahead. Somebody said uh, 80, they thought it was 85, I think. I thought it was older. I think it was 82. Maybe it was 85. <laughs> that makes sense. The RCA, JVC era. But they did have... They had popcorn. And you could find out what time movies were playing. If you call them popcorn. Oh, was that right? Was that Mr. Movie Phone? I think popcorn told you what time it was. Which robots clearly needed. 
if they're time traveling. You're trying to communicate with music. Music, I can do that. My mission on this planet's complete. Okay, Scotty, beam me up. Ooh, that tickles, but it sure beats riding the bus. Well, this brings us to the close of part one. I hope you've enjoyed it because I've really enjoyed bringing it to you. All the animations that you have seen were done in real time, no single frame recording, so that they can go to any VCR. Now I realize we've left a lot of questions unanswered, but in part two we're going to take a more detailed look at these same animations, give you some tips on how they were done. See you soon. Yeah, yeah, it's only part one. Can you imagine? There's like a series of these tapes, and they probably tell you exactly how to, you know, make very convincing propaganda with technology. So I thought that was pretty sweet. And what computer was that? Only Amiga? Um, what computer face was that? I think that involved, I don't know, all the names of every Amiga piece of software. Sorry. But it's worth knowing that the video toaster was partially developed by. Who played Garth? Uh, Dana, Dana Carvey's brother. Uh, Dana Carvey played Garth, but uh, his brother uh, worked on the video toaster, worked on the chips. He was a computer science engineer, I think went to Carnegie, and uh, worked on the chips that went into the video caster, video toaster, and the TriCaster, and uh, the Trinity, which is the TriCaster I have that's really cool. So, important stuff. Did the video we show, did you see the part where it's like, Tony Hawk, because that's another thing important in a little bit. Tony Hawk became famous literally because he had a video toaster. Did you know that? He is more famous because he made a video game after committing the 900, and that's important because the 900's like, woo. But like, the thing that really got him famous was doing these propaganda pieces about skateboarding. And, and that's also why the video game was so great because the video game, which took ideas from Dreamcast's uh, skateboard adventure action skater or whatever the heck that game was called there's like this great skateboarding game but it was like a race around thing and then they realized people like just hanging out and doing tricks and so it became more about tricks even though they kept trying to give you the speed run thing anyway he had a video toaster and he recorded all of these events his father helped him set up um and his father ran himself and then he became famous through that They're like wow greatest skateboarder in the world he's at all the skateboarding events you know Good job, though. Good job, Tony Hawk. Anything else? I don't know. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do my Tad Stones interview. I, th I just remind you guys, Tad Stones, Double O Duck. going to do that tonight. I'll try to do some um, editing and get that up for you guys as soon as possible. And then tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit more about Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7. So thank you again. And if you do feel like it, you know you could buy my T-shirts. Just reminding you, you can go to... Where my link go? Yeah, there you go. Andreas.me. www.andreas.me. And you can click on donate. Or you could go here. It's like, I think there are two different kinds of donations just to see which one works better, people like more. And then, yeah, my shirts. Tell me what designs you guys want also. Um, and great. Yeah, I can't wait to, I can't wait to, to make more videos and be there with you. So take care, everybody. Much love and follow your dreams. Hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian.
Welcome, Alyssa. It's good to have you. We're so glad you're here. Come and stay a while. Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians. 